Welcome to this free Adobe Anime Beginners course. In this fully comprehensive four and a half hour tutorial, you will be learning all the tools and basics of Adobe Animate. If you would like to learn everything there is to know about using the software like a pro, get access to the full course by clicking the link in the description box down below. Now, let's get started. Hello. On this first lesson, I'm just going to give a rundown of the actual interface and the basic tools of this program before we get on with the actual animation. So, Adobe Animate, as soon as you open, already has a few presets that you can choose. Um, when you're actually working with an animation, you should choose one that fits your objective better. But for now, just for demonstration, I'm just going to click on Full HD, which is the file format that is best for video, for example. Now, Full HD is just the size of your file. Let me try and create a new one to show you. So Full HD is 1920 by 1080 pixels. If your computer isn't very strong or powerful, you might want to use HD, for example, which has the same radio but has a lower resolution. Or you can just create a file that is smaller, has a different shape, whatever is best for you and most comfortable for practicing. I just like to keep it on full HD. Okay, so when you start, you might have this huge white canvas in front of you. If you want to zoom out, just press Ctrl minus. And now you can see the full canvas. Now your interface might look a little different. Maybe it's a little more open like this. And Adobe Animate also has different workspace setups. So you can change that up here on workspaces. I believe that it already defaults to the basic one, which is the one I'm using right now. It might be still a little different because I've already made my own changes. But this is basically the setup. Now the classic one, like it used to be when it was Adobe Flash, looks like this. Honestly, I think it's very convoluted and I don't like to see the timeline on the top. I prefer it on the bottom, but you can also manually set things up. As you start working more and more with this, you might see what's more comfortable for you. I'm just give, gonna keep it on the basic one because I think it's pretty minimalistic and it has everything you need for now at least. So on this first video, I'm going to talk mostly about the toolbar because this is what this is the part you use to actually create the images and drawings and whatever you want on this program. So before everything, I actually like to keep a certain window open, which is the property window. So it might already be here on the corner. It has these little sliders as an icon. I'm just going to pop that out like that or I can also keep it like that, but it's going to close maybe? No, so let me backtrack. The properties panel is going to be on this little icon with the sliders and I'm just gonna keep it open. It's my own preference because the properties window is based on context. So depending on what you have to select it, it's going to change. And if you can't find the properties, You'll just go over here on Windows and click on Properties and it's going to open the window for you like that. So the reason I like to keep it open is because pro the properties are going to change depending on when you have selected. It's contextual. So right now I have the Select tool, but if I go over, let's say, to the Brush tool, it's going to give me the brush settings instead of the selection settings. So I like to keep it open because it shows you all the potential of that tool and it even helps you understand it better the more you use it. So that's why I, have to, I like to keep it there. So to show you how all these tools work, I'm just going to select a color. Over here, just going to keep it black and I'm going to draw something simple on the screen. Okay, so the properties did leave. I'm going to keep it open like this so I always see it. Okay, so I use the brush tool, so I'm going to start with that. 
basically it's the one that I use the most because I like to draw hand-drawn animation so I like to use a brush because it's a much more natural form of drawing because you just use your tablet and it even has the pressure sensitivity and all that so the properties already show you uh, several things that you can change uh, the most basic ones would be the size this is where you can change them I believe there's also a shortcut for that yes so different from other softwares the icon of the brush doesn't really show you the size so that's why it's good to have the properties because by using the bracket keys these ones on your keyboard uh, you can lower and increase the size of your brush you can also set the smoothing as you can see one of the things that bothers me a little bit about adobe animates brush is that it has these little squigglies that come up when you draw but if you go that all the way to 100 it kind of gets rid of it i just think that sometimes depending on what you draw if you make something really sketchy didn't really happen much here but sometimes it deforms your drawing a lot so when i'm sketching i like to use a lower smoothing even if the drawing itself might look a little bumpy but i'm gonna keep it on 100 because that makes it a little prettier <laughs> i'm actually gonna redraw that circle so you can see the difference that that make, make. I'm going to increase the brush size. And that's a little better. This, the, the circle isn't actually very perfect, but it's going to be enough to show you everything that I want to. And you can also see different shapes for your brush. If you like to draw with a square brush, you can do that. And it may be basic, but honestly, you can get a lot of things done just with the brush tool. And going back to the order of the toolbar, another very important tool is the selection tool. So when you have the selection tool selected, um, the properties that will show are actually the document properties, just because this tool itself doesn't have much to change. So here you can set the size again so when you set it up at the beginning and you end up changing your mind you can you don't need to create something new you can just change it here you can also change the frame rate of your animation which i'll explain a little bit more on the next video for now i'm just going to stick to the tools so the selection tool basically if you drag it on your screen it can select a number of things that are on your screen so and you can also move it you can also click and drag and deform and break the shapes that you have and depending on how you want to draw this can be really useful I don't use it much but there are artists that do a lot it all depends on what you prefer to do down here also is the free transform tool which is similar but basically as soon as you select something it goes to the free transform mode you can also go into that let's say if you want to transform something and you hadn't selected this you can just press Q and it's going to already use it's already going to show you this little transforming box that you have on this tool so down here there are some properties about uh, the transform it basically changes the way you transform the object that you've selected I'm just gonna it's going to default onto free transform I just went back to that so you can basically reshape things with it so if you want to change the proportions you just go on the on the corner if you want to keep the proportions you can just hold shift and it's just going to resize your drawing you can also whoops <laughs> you can also just go through the sides and if you hover your brush right oh I mean if you hover your cursor right over the side you can skew it so if you don't really remember these shortcuts or you don't like using them uh, you can if you want to keep the if you want to keep the proportions you can just click on scale and like that you don't have to press any buttons to keep it on its original scale 
you can also distort this one is really fun if you want to make things in perspective so let's say you drew the circle but you want it to be tilted to a side you can do that and that makes it sort of look like it's going back in space but you can you can have a lot of fun with it it really it's even more flexible than the normal free transform tool so also if you see me going back on the things I did, I'm just pressing Ctrl Z, so that undoes everything you do. So I draw something, but it's not the way I want it to, just press Ctrl Z. And if you want to redo that, you press Ctrl Shift Z, basically. And it's very, very important. <laughs> so next up, another selection related tool is the lasso tool. So instead of having that classic box that you do when you slide, this one allows you to draw out the shape. Again, it works very well with more complex drawings. So these were our selection tools. Now to the more drawing related tools. First up, we have the pen tool. Now it's already selecting the last thing I drew for some reason, the last thing I selected. I'm just going to see if clicking out of it, it doesn't do that. Yes. So Adobe Animate has some things that are a little bit fussy with that sometimes. The, the pen tool is very similar to what you see in Adobe Illustrator in which you don't really organically draw something. You kind of create a line point by point and you can also create curves just by sliding your brush so if you're used to that this can be really good to make very precise line art and we'll get into line art and making your drawings look good at a later stage but just so you know that this exists and once you master this tool it can really really give you a lot of flexibility pretend I did not undo all that <laughs> Next up is the brush tools. So I was using the classic brush tool, which as I said, is the more classic one. It's more simple. And when I'm just sketching and doodling things on this, that's what I prefer to use. And I already sort of showed you the different things that it can do. There's also the fluid brush, which is basically a brush tool that has a lot more it's basically a brush tool that has a lot more properties so you can change for example the taper of your brush so you can do this but the roundness isn't very high here you go so as you see the roundness was down and it made it a little bit more squared but i put it on 100 percent, and now it's a perfect circle if you want the taper to be a lot more noticeable can drag that up and it kind of looks like an ink paint brush it's really cool so you can just have a lot of fun with the different settings that this has I'm gonna put this down a little bit there you go and it's more similar to the sort of brushes that you see in Photoshop and it's a lot more similar to the brushes that you see in other drawing software and for a long time, this brush was not even available. Adobe has recently started to give a bit more attention to Adobe Animate and just give us a lot more possibilities to draw here. Next up is the eraser. It's pretty basic. You can just erase things and you can change the size as the other brushes. It also responds to pressure sensitivity. So when it says minimum size is the one is the size that shows up when you give it a very light pressure and then you can pressure the the tip of your pen a little bit more and it increases just like the brush. The eraser is actually selective to what you draw sometimes. So for example, the brush tool that I used over here, it uses fills. So I can select it to only erase fills. Actually, it was already selected <laughs> and it will erase these. But for example, the pen tool only draws with strokes. So if I use it over the pen tool, it does not erase. It even 
let me zoom out. It shows a little white outline wherever you draw, but it's not going to stay there. So even if I do that, it's not really erasing. It's just so showing me the line that it created. But it can also erase everything if you just wanted to. So I did this and it's going to erase the lines as well. Or it can only erase lines like that and not fills. I'm going to explain more about the difference between strokes and fills on another lesson, but I'm already showing you that they exist because they are already part of certain properties of the tools that I'm showing. Now, something that will actually help me show you how strokes and fills are different is with the shape tool. So we are on a rectangle tool. So as, as the name says, you can just make rectangles. But I'm talking about the strokes and fills. Right now you can't really see that because everything is black. If I select this, as you can see, it has selected the fill. If I click here, it has selected the stroke. To select this this tool without clicking on it, I just press the V key. So it goes straight to that. Now, if I want to change the color of the fill so I can show you better, I selected a red color and now you can see it has a fill and a stroke in different colors. So I can actually even remove the fill like this. I can break the line and just do everything I want, basically. And you can, so the difference between lines and fills is that the lines, or better, the strokes, you can change your, you can change the size at a later stage if you prefer. It is, it is a lot more vectorized in a way. When something is ve is a vector, you can modify it a lot more instead of bitmap, such as Photoshop. But Adobe Animate works only with vectors when you are drawing. So lines, you can also, when you want to distort them, let me try that. Yes, they all move together, but the fills, they are basically a filled in shape. So when you do that, it's only going to bend one of the sides, just like here. The brush is a fill tool, so it's only going to move the edge of your shape, whereas the brush tool, which is, sorry, the pen tool where I, I use it here, is going to move everything with it. So let me just fix that square. There we go. <laughs> and the, the shape tool has other things. So it also has an oval tool. Why is this stroke gray? There we go. Now I change the stroke to back to black. And it also has a polygon tool, which here on the properties you can set, let's say you can make it a polygon. And it's going to have six, five sides, like it says here, or you can do that and set it to eight, and it's going to be an octagon if you want it to be. You can also create stars, and just like the other tools, it has a lot of flexibility that you can see here on the properties. Let me go back here to the rectangle. So I, ch I change the subtools by clicking and holding, and a lot of tools actually have this, so they have subtools down here, which sometimes don't even have much to do. For some reason, the transform tool can change to the gradient transform tool. And the lasso tool also has different settings that you can choose. So as for the shape tool, it has different shapes that you can create. Next to it is the line tool. It's an even more rudimentary version of this pen tool, but you can only kind of create the individual lines. You can't really connect them as well as the pen tool. I prefer using the pen tool if I want to create straight lines, but it also has the normal old, let's say, line tool that existed way before the pen tool did back in the day, I guess. So these were the basic drawing tools. There's also the text tool, but I'm not really going to get into it right now. It's pretty basic as well, because we're not really going to use this much for animation. 
Now, now that I'm talking about, a, for example, a tool that I don't use much, you can really organize everything that you want down here on the three dots icon. So let's say I don't really use the, the text tool, so I'm just going to drag it out and it's going to go back to its place. I might go into other tools that are here that I'm not talking about right now, but I have the ones that I use out here because I realized over time that these were the ones that are most important to me. This pin tool also I don't use. I don't know why it was hit there. Okay, so now we have the fill tool. Let me deselect that. And it's the paint bucket tool that we all see in different softwares. So it's going to fill in fills or the other lines. I don't think it, yeah, it only works with fill. So it's not going to, to color your lines. If, if you've made them, you actually, actually have to, you actually have to select them and then change the stroke and all that. So that's something important to remember. Let me go back to that. But you can fill in lines that you've made, like, and if you, if you've closed a certain line, you can actually fill it in like that. And you can also fill in fill created lines with the brush tool as well. So this is obviously really handy when you're when you're drawing and let's say you you've created a character and you just want to fill in all the colors after you've lined it um, basically just use the paintbrush tool um, it also has some properties that you can either select down here it's also up here in the properties tab to close or not close gaps so right now with these simple shapes you can very clearly see what is open and what is closed here is an open shape these are closed but when you're actually creating some drawings you can really it can be really hard to notice if a shape is closed or not just like i did here now because it's vectorized you can really really zoom in and see that it's not closed at all but if you are down here at the paint bucket tool and it says don't don't close gaps and you click here it's not going to close that's why i like to keep it on close small gaps because it's going to do it for you and if you have really large gaps you can also make it make its tolerance a little larger and then we're getting to the end this is the eyedropper tool, so it lets you pick up the colors that you have already seen on your screen, even the background. It already sets straight to the paint bucket tool because a lot of the times when you're picking up colors, it's when you're using that. And it's actually a pretty, pretty practical that it automatically goes to the paint bucket tool as we'll see when we're working with drawings. It also selects the background color for some reason if you need that, but if I wanted to use this red again, it already selects the fill color if it's the one on on the front. Now, yeah, you can actually just change around the color that you have on your fill over to the stroke if you are actually selecting the color for the stroke. So let's say I chose this and I want to make a red stroke. But if I do that, it's going to go for a fill because generally speaking, if you're using the eyedropper tool usually is for fills, so it already automa automatically does that, but you can click on this little swap icon. You can also just press X and it's going to swap the two colors over here. And now you have a red stroke color if that's what you wanted. And lastly, I've already kind of spoken about these, but you can use the hand tool to move around your canvas. You can also, if you're using any other tool, if you hold the space bar, you're just going to automatically be in the hand tool and you can pan your canvas like that. But if you don't want to keep pressing it, you can just select it. Another uh, very, another sort of secret of this program is that you, if you double click on the hand tool, it will center your canvas on the screen. And lastly is the zoom tool. So you can use Ctrl plus and minus to zoom, but you can also select this. If you click, it's going to zoom in. And if you hold Alt 
and click out you will and click it will zoom out also if you don't want to hold alt to zoom out you can just select it to zoom out like that and if you want to zoom in again just select it again so these were the basic tools that I feel like are the most important when you're starting out in case you're new to this software. On the next video, I'm going to talk about the timeline, which I think is the most important part of the software when you're working with animation. So see you next time. Hello. On this lesson, I'm going to talk about the layers and the timeline tool in general. So I've already set up my file basically the same as before but on this one I have already set my FPS or frames per second to 24. Now that's just my preference because I like working with hand-drawn animation but if you like paper doll animation or motion graphics 30 frames per second might be better because it will make your animation smoother but for hand-drawn and practicing purposes 24 is more than enough. If you want to change the FPS for your file, you just go on the general document settings and the FPS window is right over here. So before we get started with the timeline, which is probably the most important part when working with animation, I want to first of all explain layers in case you're not familiar with them. Layers are very important in digital art because they allow you to stack images on top of each other. So this helps you to not have to rework a lot if, for example, you made a mistake. And it helps you just generally organize your drawings in your work a lot better than working traditionally. So over here is our layer window. and. I'll create a few just to, for you to see how it kind of looks if you have a lot of layers. And as you can see, they have this order to them. They are one on top of the other and the most recent ones are put on top of everything else. So to demonstrate a little better, for example, I'm going to just draw a random line. And this is on the bottom most layer. Now, if I go to the layer literally on top of that one and draw a different line, and I'm going to use a different color for you to see this, it's going to be obviously on top. Now, the difference this does when working on the same layer or separating in different layers is that you can change this. For example, if I drag the first one over the second one like I did just now, it's going to be on top of the one that was previously on top of the black line. And I can undo that, and now it's like it was before. So when I say it preserves your drawings, if you separate them by layers, is that if I disable the layer on top, which is on this little eye icon, it just, it only erases that one that I selected, all the information that is on the specific layer, and I can just put it on back again. Now I'm going to show you what would have happened if I had done everything on the same layer. I'm just going to delete these ones on the top because we don't need them right now. Just using the trash can layer with the ones. So you just click on the trash can layer and it will delete the layers that are selected that are in blue so again i'm going to keep everything on the same layer so i'm not going to select layer two i'm going to draw a line and then with another color so you can differentiate i'm going to draw another line now let's say i did not like the the red line obviously right now because i just did it i could have just undone but sometimes if you're way too far in your drawing and you've already done a lot of other things and you can't really go back as far or it will just delete everything that you've already done the problem with having something underneath is as you can see the selection tool won't really select the entire line like before because if i select the red one which is all still one single shape 
it will have sort of erased the things that are underneath it. So this is what happens when you draw on the same layer. And when it comes to the selection tool, it will select the things that are the same color. So this one, I can separate the red line specifically because it's different than the one under it, underneath it. Wait, I keep pulling the vertices. If you click on it and then drag it, there you go. But had I done it in black, and I'm still on the same layer, that's an even bigger problem because now that everything is the same color, it will all become one single shape. You cannot separate them anymore. So if you want to use different layers but still separate the shapes, I'm sorry, if you want to use the same colors but still have them separated, that's when separating your layers is very important because if I draw that on the same with the same color on a different layer, it will no longer select them like one single shape because layers, they will keep the selection from doing that. And now I can easily separate them or select them on their own in case you want to change something about it. And now I'm just going to explain some other functions in the layer window. So let's say you're sketching something and I like to sketch with a different color. Usually I actually use some shade of blue. So let's say I just want to draw a smiley face. And now if I wanted to finalize the drawing because it might be too rough and I want to make it look nicer, then of course I would go to a different layer and just draw over it. Now something that might be really useful when you're working with several layers is if you want to isolate a layer and make sure that you don't, let's say, accidentally draw inside it, you can lock it. So on this little lock icon, you just click it on the layer you want to lock. And now you can't really do anything on it. You can't select it, you can't deform it, and you can't even draw on it. It will even warn you if it's locked, and if you click on yes, it will unlock it for you. So I like to do that when I'm sketching because it might really prevent me from from making a terrible mistake. And if you start, as I said, if you start finalizing a drawing on the wrong layer, it's going to end up erasing the sketch underneath it. Yeah, that's not even going to look better. <laughs> but that was just for an example. Now, another thing that might be useful when you're using sketches is lowering the opacity of the layer. You can do that by double clicking on the paper icon over here, or, or you can right click and click on properties. It's the same thing. So over here, you can also lock and unlock it. And on visibility is where you can change the opacity. So if I click here and click OK, it's going to lower the opacity. Just to show you what that means, I'm going to unlock it so I can select it. Opacity is basically the transparency of your drawing. So if it's on 100% opacity, it means it's completely opaque. And so nothing can go through it. But since it's on 50%, it is half transparent. And you can really see that when you put a different background underneath it. You can see that the darker background shows through. You can also customize the amount of opacity that you're lowering. It already sort of defaults to 50, but if you click, you can type the amount that you want, or you can slide to an even lower or bigger amount. And like this, oh, sorry, there we go. And with 10%, you see it's barely even visible. I'm just going to keep it normally visible like this. And I'm going to get into the other properties later and really explain them better. But another useful one that I already want to, to touch on is the guide layer. So when you choose guide layer, it basically, it, it doesn't really change anything that you can do on the layer, but also it changes the little icon over here. But it's also another thing to help you when you're exporting your animation so that the guide layers, they will not be exported in the final file. 
And again, this will make more sense later on, but I wanted to leave that explained now and I put it back to normal. Now, let's say another thing that is very important when it comes to organization is folders. So here we have two layers and let's say this is one certain character and I've sketched him and I've finalized his drawing and <laughs> this one actually looks worse, but you get what I mean. And now I want to draw a new character and you know, I'm going to start drawing it and all that stuff. But so I can keep myself even more organized, it's very important to use folders. Basically, you click on the folder icon over here. Now, this folder will be for our first character. And so if you want to put these two layers that I've used pre uh, previously, you just hold shift so you can select more than one layer. Select the ones you want and drag them inside the folder. And now the folder will only contain these and you can even collapse it by clicking on this little arrow. And if I, let me keep them all visible here. And if I click on the eye icon, it's going to affect all the layers inside of it. And as you might imagine with very complex files, this is very important. And again, if I want to create a new one, now I have two folders with my two different characters. And they all just stay together like that. I'm just going to keep the original one. And now for the final things I want to explain is just the other icons that you can see over here. They're pretty simple. So the one over here, it says show all layers as outlines. Um, if you click on the one here on top, it's going to affect all the layers that you select. But you can also do that by clicking the specific layer you want to be affected by that. So as you might have seen, if I click on that, it's going to all just become an outline and that may be useful if you again you're sketching or you want the layers to just have a very low contrast this can be pretty useful and you can also deform things still as outlines I personally don't use this very much but some people might prefer using it Also, if for some reason you want to change the outline, which it really isn't the, the true color of your layer, again, it's the one that is actually on the object on your canvas, these colors are just to separate them and differentiate them. In the properties, you can change that to any color you want. Also, these are all preset, uh, as I said, default swatches, but you can create new colors and specific colors by clicking on that color wheel. And lastly is the highlight option. So it really is just, again, to make layers more easy to find. So if you click on this, it'll just create a little line over here to highlight the layer. Like that. So that was all I had to say about layers and let's get to the timeline in the next video. Hello! So now I'm going to talk about the actual timeline. So this is the part where you get to organize the frames of your animation. As soon as you open your file, you already have one layer and one frame set. Now I'm going to see if I can increase the size of this, I believe it's over here. So if you just click on here, it will sort of zoom in for you. And that doesn't really change anything. It just makes it a little easier for you to see. All right. So over here, it basically just counts the number of frames for you. And because mine is set to 24 frames per second, when 
it hits a second it already marks it for you just to make it a little easier for you to time your drawings so now that i haven't drawn anything yet as you can see this little icon over here has a blank this frame that is the only one we have it has a little white circle inside it or better it's a blank circle it means it hasn't been filled yet there is no data inside this frame yet and as soon as i draw something it becomes filled in and a little lighter so there is information inside of it now you can let's say extend that frame by clicking on insert keyframe and it will create another identical frame next to it. And if I click on insert blank keyframe, it's going to create a new frame without any information in it. So now comes a little bit of differentiation on the types of frames. Next to it, says inserts frame so as you can see it didn't say keyframe that means that it's only going to hold the drawing for more than one frame this is all the same one but if i want to create a new frame it will become blank and i can draw anything else so we had a, a circle and now we have a, a triangle and if I want to hold this circle for a longer time, I just keep pressing on insert frame and it will last longer. The difference it makes for inserting a keyframe, I'm just going to delete this one. If I were to click on this one, they may seem the same, but they are the two different frames because if I were to add anything to this sorry so if i were to add anything to this drawing it's not going to affect the the one after it because they are separated they may look the same but they have been separated as two different frames and when i say a frame is held this is when I'm talking about timing. So I can play the animation by clicking play. And let's let's extend this one for a little longer. And create a new blank frame. And let's draw anything random again. I'll just draw a triangle so it can really differentiate. As you can see, I've held this one longer than the second frame, so it stays longer on the screen. And this one only stays for one frame, but it's pausing on the end. We can really see the actual timing if we put this on loop. So I'm just going to click on this and you drag this slider all the way to the end. So it loops the entire animation. So yeah, as you can see, one single frame is very little time. It's like a blink. Okay, so I'm just going to delete everything for now. So the the remove frames button it only it only really works if you have selected the specific frame you want to do that on. So I'm just going to start from scratch again and for now i'm just making very random drawings and i'm not really going into the animation principles because i just want to show you the actual function of everything here but let's say you, you want to make this ball move right and you want to keep it very similar to the one next to it because if I create a new frame, I don't see anything. So it, it's very difficult to know where exactly it was. I wanted to move in to the, to the right. So you might think this is very hard and yes, it is. So for you to have a better idea of what came after the frame you were working on, there is the onion skin tool. 
Now, the onion skin basically allows you to see behind. So this was the previous frame, so it's showing you a little hint of it on the back. So now, if I want to draw a similar thing next to it, I can. And now it's sort of moving, and I can keep going like this. I'm just going to make a few more to show you a little bit more about how this tool works. So I've drawn a few little circles and if I play it, it moves, right? So about the onion skin, as you can see, the ones that are coming after are highlighted in green and the ones backwards are red. Now, you can customize your onion skin almost entirely. Before we get to the actual settings, you can see there are two little sliders next to it. This is how much, how much other frames are exposed. So if you want just one frame behind or after you, you can just set it to a single frame. And again, you can make that a lot longer, a lot like that and they keep going darker and darker. So if you click and hold, we can go to advanced setti settings. So this is where you can really customize everything. Now, for example, you can set it to outlines. So the outlines can be very useful if your onion skin looks very convoluted, but generally I like to just keep it filled. You can also change the colors of the, the the color of the onion skin also you can just keep this open in case you like to change them around a lot you can also make the opacity of them a lot lower again this can help if it looks too convoluted i think 50 percent is a pretty good number let me do that and again you can make them a lot fainter as they go by so if i really make this a lot higher, you can see how faint the ones way on the back already look like. Again, I like the default 10%, but honestly, depending on what I'm working, I just keep this open and just I'm changing them all the time. And the other settings over here will make more sense as we go. And yeah, it says all frames. Again, if you have a really long animation, it will select everything and so on. Now, the yeah, the show keyframes only will work better if we have a lot of frames that are he being held for a longer time. These are all keyframes, meaning they aren't held. They're all just one single frame, one after the other. But let me just hold them for a much longer time. So I'm just adding with this button and I'm holding them for five frames each. To show you again the difference this makes, now everything will move past a lot slower than before. Before they just zipped through very fast, but now that they have five frames each, they go by pretty slowly. And as you can see, I have this range, but now that there are a lot of frames to be held in front of me. It doesn't even show me. Obviously, I can just do this. So I've extended this all the way to the point where it finally touches the next frame. So if I'm working on something that is way back, it's already going to be very faint and it's going to become stronger as I move closer. But because they are so far apart, sometimes they can be very they start to become very faint you can change that by saying show keyframes only i'll show you some very basic tools on the advanced settings some things will make more sense as we start making more complex animations but really this is the most basic and universal thing that you can see about onion skins and it's really what you're going to use the most all right so a little more about how frames are made so as you can see, I've done this in a pretty traditional way, as in drawing them each as new drawings. Now there are many different ways that you can go about this. Let me do this again with a little circle uh, going by, except 
For example, if you really want to make this look very a lot more consistent, for example, you can create a new keyframe which will basically copy and paste it next to it. So our onion skin is on. Now it's not showing us anything because there are on the same they are on the same place. But I want to make it move so I can just select it, hold shift so that it goes it moves straight. And now it is exactly the same drawing, but it has moved. And I can keep doing that. So the drawing can stay the same. As I said before, one single frame is actually very fast. And on hand-drawn animation, usually things are held for two or three frames. So that's what I mean when I say that even if we set it to 24 frames per second, it doesn't necessarily mean that they, there will be 24 drawings per second. If I kept doing this like this by holding them by two frames, there will be 12 drawings per second, actually. And as you can see, they already moved a lot slower. Now, I could keep doing this by hand, but Adobe Animate already has some things that, let's say, are sort of automatic. So let's go back to just having one single frame over here. And let's say, as I was doing before, I want to make this circle move from one side of, of the... I want to make this circle move from one side of the canvas to the other. So I could keep doing that by hand, which gives us a certain effect, or I can do this automatically. So let's say I wanted to take exactly one second. So I'm going to go here and create a new frame. As you can see, because I went all the way to another place in the timeline, it's going to hold this frame for 23 frames and then change to the 24th. Now, because it creates this copy, it might look a little ran a little weird if you're working with hand-drawn animation, but it does that because it's already thinking we might be using tweens. So what are tweens? They are what I've been saying, the automatic animation. So, okay, I wanted to take a full second. It's going to start on one end and on this new frame, I want it to go all the way over here. So for now, it's just going to keep holding it and then suddenly change. We want it to move on every single frame of these. So if I select this first frame and create, yes, insert classic tween. Now it's going to create, it's going to turn it into a symbol, which I will explain a little later on the next video, but for now, I'm just gonna let it do whatever it wants. And now it's going to animate on its own, let's say. So this can really help by simplifying the animation process, but it does create a very different feel to it. Hand animating things makes, th makes things look a lot more organic. And this already goes on sort of motion graphic territory. But we will go into more complex ways of animating this. But for now, I just wanted to show you the very basic timeline tools. One last thing I want to show is that if you're still starting out and these little little circles and icons are still kind of confusing to you, we can actually change that by going over here and it gives us even more options about the presentation of the timeline itself. So over here, we are on the standard view, but if we put on, how is it, preview, right? It actually previews the actual drawing. So instead of having to scrub through the timeline to find the drawing you want, it's going to show you the actual drawings of each layer. So that can help you sort of just see what you're actually working with if you're still a beginner. This might actually be helpful. And there are many things. You can make the, the little icons shorter, it can be taller. Just, I feel like for me, it's medium is just fine. And 
the the rest of the things aren't really that relevant but i feel like preview can really help you if the, just these little squares are still a little bit confusing and you're you might struggle to visualize them at first but once you work with a lot of animation and you have a lot of layers on the preview can be a little bit convoluted because there's going to be a bunch of drawings in your timeline but that's the basics of the timeline and very soon we will actually start animating see you soon hello so on this lesson, I'm going to talk a little bit about symbols. Just sort of showing you they exist. I'm going to show some scenes that I've produced in the past with symbols at a later date when we're creating more complex animations. But I just want to explain quickly what they are and the difference between these two types of symbols because a lot of people ask questions about this. So symbols are a way to sort of repeat an animation inside your your timeline it's really good for looping animation or just something really repetitive that you want to sometimes reuse in a scene and it just allows you to also save a little clip of animation and just save drawings for later in a library because it gets saved inside this little library on your file. Now it's a little hard to explain just with words so I'm actually going to animate a little bit here so you can sort of understand better. Now before that I'm just going to set this layer as a guide and you'll see why. I just don't want it to show up in the animation later. So I drew this little fairy. It's just a very simplified version of a fairy. Just the body and then the little wings like this and I like to draw them like this because it, it's actually a little bit simpler to animate so let's say you want to draw a lot of little fairies or butterflies flying around in the background of a scene now they're going to be moving around and batting their wings and it can be really difficult and frustrating to have to draw every single frame of that so what we can do is animate a little standalone fairy moving its wings and then just repeat that along our scene so i've only drawn the first frame and that's always what you want to do when you want to create a symbol is don't really animate straight on your timeline just draw the first thing or just do a little squiggly line so that you can actually generate a symbol so you're going to select your your file sorry so first you're going to select your layer and press f8 on your keyboard and now it's going to say convert to symbol and always good to um, name your layers of what they actually are so I'm going to say fairy movie clip and this is going this is kind of redundant but usually just names are always very good to be as straightforward as possible so over here you have your symbol types and i'm only going to cover movie clip and graphic and not button because button has more to do with what used to be called flash games when animate was called adobe flash and it has to, more to do with coding and making little games and it's not really used in animation at all at least what I know about. So first we're just going to create a movie clip. It really doesn't initially make much of a difference and I'm pretty sure you can change that if you've accidentally made the wrong type but let's first just make a movie clip. So a very important thing about symbols is that they have their own timeline with its own layers and you can sort of stack layers inside of a single symbol it's, and it's not even going to show on your root timeline as it's called or the main timeline. And you can see this by clicking twice on your symbol. By the way, when you create a symbol, it's going to be inside this little box. Click twice and now over here you can see it's saying that we're inside the symbol. If you have anything else on your canvas, it's going to be sort of dimmed so it shows that you're isolating this so now it only it has its own little timeline as you could see before we have two layers one with this little text that i made and our symbol 
And in here, the symbol only has one layer, and for now I'm just going to keep it at a single layer. But if we created a bunch of layers, if you're, let's say, animating a whole character inside a symbol, and we came back, it's still only going to be sort of everything inside the symbol. And I'm even going to do this so that we can differentiate. So let's go back inside the symbol, and I'm just going to delete all these layers. And I'm going to animate this very, very simply. I'm going to extend these layers, then create a new one, get my onion skin on, and now I'm going to move the wings. I could redraw them, but honestly, this is already so simplified. I'm going to use the lasso tool and press Q, move the pivot point to the base of the wing and just rotate it a little bit, move it a little bit to the right and do the same with the other one. Rotate it. And now, if I go back and forth, it's moving its wings. It's going to be just that, really. Just so I can show you, just so I can demonstrate. So I'm scrubbing the timeline without my mouse by using the larger and smaller these two keys on my keyboard so that you can just go back and forth without using your mouse. It's really good to go from one frame to the other so you can compare easier. So let me loop that to kind of show you how it looks. By pressing enter, it plays your animation and it's just very, very rudimentary animation for now. But that's, I think this is enough. So let's go back here. So the symbol is only exposed for a single frame. So it's not going to actually show you this animation we just created. Okay, so our symbol is only being exposed for a single frame. So it's not going to show us anything because we don't really have any animation being played on the root timeline. So I'm just going to go over to 24 frames so I can have a single second of this fairy moving its wings. So I'm just going to create this frame and hide that so that it's not flashing. And okay, if you play your animation, you'll see that it's not really doing anything. And that's the thing with movie clips. It doesn't really show on your actual canvas the looping that you just created. But if you press Ctrl Enter, you're going to test your animation. And when you test, it's always going to loop on itself. And it's showing us how the animation turned out. And you might be wondering, like, why doesn't it play and stuff? I believe it sort of takes less power from your computer when, it, when you use a movie clip because it doesn't have to actually show you the animation on your timeline. And soon I'm going to compare the movie clip and the graphic next to each other so that you see the actual difference. But just to already show you, movie clips actually have a lot more flexibility when it comes to blending modes. If you've ever used Photoshop or some sort of digital art software, you'll know blending modes, basically it's, it's a way to manipulate colors and you can create lights and shadows. Um, I'm going to show this to you when we're actually sort of illustrating in Adobe Animate and how you can use effects and again blending modes to make everything look more finished. But I'm already going to say that movie clips have blending modes and graphics don't. So if you are thinking about using a, a a symbol to add effects to your animation, then make a movie clip because you can do all these things over here. There are actually a lot more settings that you can do. You can set where it's going to be on the canvas and all that stuff. But honestly, I don't use the rest of these things. I don't think they're very common, but blending modes can be very, very useful. And now I'll show you the difference when using blending modes on symbols and without symbols. But okay, we created created this for now. It doesn't make much sense what's going on with symbols, but I'm just going to recreate the same animation using a graphic. So again, 
when you select a symbol, you can actually just change the kind of symbol it is. Thankfully, you don't have to redo everything if you make a mistake. But I'm just going to copy and paste, sorry, not the actual drawing, but the layer. So I'm just going to duplicate the layer. I'm going to call it Fairy 2. Now, I'm going to set the first symbol as a guide so that it doesn't show when we test the animation. By the way, since I was talking about the whole test animation thing by pressing Ctrl Enter, now is the time where I really can show you the difference between guide and normal layers. So as you can see, this little text thing that I made, it's only exposed for one single frame, so I could start the class with something. Um, but let's just put it back as a normal layer. So if I press Ctrl Enter, it's going to flash on the beginning of the animation every time. Even though, even if I hide it from the timeline, if I sort of, this sort of creates a preview of the actual exported animation for you. And it's still showing. So if you don't want a layer to ever show when you export or test your animation, you want to make it a guide. So for now, I'm just gonna cre just gonna leave the guide as on. So now I'm just gonna keep the first symbol as a guide so that it never shows when I'm testing. So you can see which one I'm I'm showing you. Anyway, so now I'm just gonna change this to a graphic. So I've transformed this to a graphic. Now before we actually get to playing our animation, you need to go down here to looping. And generally, I'm going to use play graphic in loop. That's, I think, is the most useful form of using a graphic. Now, over here, there's lip syncing. Now, I'm going to get to lip syncing later, but yes, graphics can be used for lip syncing animation when you have the little math and you just sort of change the drawing depending on the sound. Now, I'm not going to show you this because it's an entirely different way of using graphics. For now, I'm just mostly showing you the most use, use <laughs> of the graphic. But over here, you want it to be looping and make sure that it's looping all of the frames. So it's sort of starting on frame one and, and ending still on frame one so it's not going to show you anything i'm suspecting this is a sort of error on this version of animate because generally this should be automatically going to the very end of your animation so you sort of want to drag it out to the right and it's going to be on the maximum on all the frames because sorry <laughs> When you go in here, it only has eight frames and you can't really do that inside the symbol. You need to be outside of it. So it only has eight frames. So even if I put a large number like 50, it's going to go straight to eight because that's the number of frames this actually has. But anyway, now that I fixed the loop thing, if we play it, it's actually working on the timeline. It's actually showing you the loop. So you don't really need to test your animation when you're using graphics. And I think if you're making something really simple, as I said, a, a simple loop, I think graphic is great because you don't need to keep testing and you know what's actually going on. But as I said before, it doesn't have blending modes. I think, honestly, you can still sort of edit some of the things like the brightness and the transparency which is alpha in this case and that's i think is great so when you click on the symbol on the outside without actually going inside of it because when you're inside you only you get to edit the actual frames just like on the root timeline but when you're in the root timeline and just select the symbol this is where you can actually edit it so as you can probably see the difference on the graphic, it doesn't have all those options before. So it's not as flexible because, and honestly, this is kind of sort of programming talk, so I can't really go that deep into it. But basically, the graphic is directly rooted on your main timeline. So that's why it shows. And but because of that, you can't really edit it too much. You can't really create blending modes. You can sort of add some effects, just sort of 
editing the brightness and stuff. And even though a lot of animators will tell you that graphic is the one to go, sometimes when I made my short film, I actually only used movie clips because I needed to have those effects. However, if you really need to use a graphic for some reason and you want to add effects, you'll have to do this on the actual drawings. And that also means on individual frames. So that's why it's hard to use effects because sure, you can go inside and now it will have the blending modes if you go over to frame. So as it says, you're editing only the frame and this is where you can actually add the other effects, but then you have to do this on every single one. And if you're using the movie clip, you can do a lot more things with effects and you can also program it apparently. So yeah, they both have their own uses and I think it comes to personal preference, which one you actually use. It also depends on your project. As I said, on my short film, I actually use movie clips because I wanted to add effects. All right, so one last very common use for symbols when it comes to looping. Um, you can do this on either of them. I'm going to use the graphic because it's going to be more visually understandable. So you have this little fairy batting its wings, but you also want it to be moving around. So this is where looping is really interesting because let me move it all the way here. It's still going to be on the same place. So that's something cool. You can move it around and you're not just going to be moving one single frame because let's say you did this all over your root timeline, which will sort of look like this. If you grab this frame and move it, it's only going to move the single frame. So that's why using symbols can be useful. Sometimes you might even want to throw all of your layers of a single character in a symbol because it just makes everything a lot easier to move around and adjust. And that's actually a mistake that I made a lot when I animated my short film is that I didn't do that to my characters. So actually, I'm already going to give you a little trick in case you actually end up doing that. So you want to move a character that already has several frames um, you can actually select several frames at once and by that you're going to use this little tool over here. So I noticed that right now on the default interface on the current version, if it's not showing on your, on your tools right over here, you go on Customize Timeline Tools and it's going to look like this and you just click on it and it's going to show up and you can also sort of organize the tools i believe but anyway if you click on it you can select a range of frames that you want to edit and as you can see they sort of show up at the same time and this is where you can edit them as if they were all in the same layer sort of and you can move them around but as you can see it's a bit of a hassle <laughs> so that's why it's really good to not only organize things in layers, but also in symbols. So you can really just make things a lot easier to correct and adjust as you go, because you don't, you're not necessarily making mistakes sometimes. You're just adjusting things and polishing them as you're finishing your animation, for example. But anyway, I sort of digressed. <laughs> so let's say I want this fairy to be flying from one side to the other of our canvas. So I'm going to go to the last frame and create a new one where I want it to go. So I'm going to press shift so that it moves straight. And now I want it to go from here to here. As I, as I showed you on a previous lesson, I can make it automatically move by creating a classic tween. And wow, it moved pretty fast actually. <laughs> but as you can see, it's batting its wings. It's kind of hard to see because it's moving really fast. So I'm going to make it a little longer. And yeah, you can see it's batting its wings as it goes. So that's what makes symbols really practical because sure, this is really simple animation, but for example, you can 
draw somebody walking in a walk cycle and only have to draw them moving in place and then just adjusting their movement across the scene and so on. If there's a character in the background just sort of doing random movements to add some life to your animation, you can do that in a symbol so that it's looping around. And those are the basics of symbols and we will be coming back to them every now and then and I'm going to show you a little bit more possibilities inside of them but yeah that's how they work and see you next time hello so for the next few lessons i'm going to talk about the 12 principles of animation these principles have been used for several decades when it comes to learning and teaching animation because they've really boiled down all of the factors that come into making a quality animation and when you keep them in mind and really understand each of these principles, they can really improve your work. So these principles, they were sort of created back in the day with Walt Disney and the Nine Old Men, which were sort of the first animators to work with them. And ever since then, they've been kind of polished and adapted to the different kinds of animation that we've developed. But honestly, they've they stayed they have stayed pretty strong over time because it's really it really goes down to, all the way to the basics and they're kind of timeless so the first one i'll be talking about and it's usually the first one to be talked about all the time is timing and spacing and it really is the most important thing to keep in mind i think timing and spacing it's part of all the other principles you really can't do them without keeping all of this that i'm going to talk about in mind and they are timing and spacing they're kind of put into the same principle because they walk hand in hand and you can't really talk about one without talking about the other and we've sort of already talked a little bit about this when i was showing you how to use the timeline it really comes down to how you use it and how you organize your drawings but not just that, it really, it also has to do a lot about a theoretical understanding about how things move. So before we get into the very complex bits, the more complex bits, I'm going to start off with an example. So we're on the first frame and the circle or the ball is always used in examples because anyway, you got to keep things simple, right? So let's say you, you have a ball that starts here and ends all the way here, right? So just because I have these two, the, the two spaces, right? The, the two places that the ball is going to move from point A to point B, we don't really know how long it's going to take. It could take a minute. It could take a second. The space is still the same. So because the, the space is the, still the same, it all comes down to how you distribute your drawings to give life to this animation. So I'm going to start sort of actually animating to, to give you an idea. So as usual, I'm going to keep my onion skin on and already uh, sort of Something I like to do f to keep my drawings more or less consistent is that, you know, since it's going to be all the way to the other side or anyway, you're going to make a drawing next to each other, you might get it terribly wrong if you just draw it like that. It could be a lot bigger, a lot smaller, and you might not even notice, which is kind of part of the human eye nature. We don't, sometimes we don't notice these sort of things. So something you can do with the onion skin is actually use it as a reference. So if it's something more complex, obviously you can sort of place some guidelines. But since this is just a circle, I can actually sort of trace it and use that as a reference. And I'm just going to sort of animate this straight ahead. And for now, I'm just going to keep everything more or less evenly spaced.
Now I like to make the drawings from scratch because I just like the look of it, honestly. I feel like actually hand drawn, you know, actually making every frame more or less from scratch. I think it it gives it a more a, a cooler flow to it. And as you can see, we can already, the animation's already sort of taking shape. Just a little bit more to go. One or two more. <laughs> Keep pulling it like that. Okay, I think this is good. Now it's zipping out, it's zipping through pretty fast, so I'm actually just going to add some extra frames. And you can call this animating in twos because I'm holding each frame for two frames. Each drawing for two <laughs> frames. So, okay. As you can see, I'm going to keep it sort of smaller. I think this is better. The ball is moving from one place to the other and it just suddenly stops, right? So let's just keep this looping. So the ball is moving pretty much evenly, right? Because it's it's doing that because all the drawings are spaced more or less equally. I don't change the distance very much. If I expand this onion skin, you can see them all at once. And I kind of space them so that the edges would always touch in between each frame. So if they're all moving the same amount of space in the same amount of time, it's going to move evenly. And let's see, this gave us 18 frames. So if I were to extend the exposure of each drawing to let's say four frames, it would take twice as long. On the other hand, the animation will look a lot more choppy because there aren't much there aren't many frames in between anymore. Literally, these frames are called in betweens for a, for a reason. And if I would if I were to do that, it goes slower, but it's also very choppy. And so, to make that smoother, you need to add more and more frames. So the general thinking with that is: if something is moving fast, you use less frames, and if something is moving slow, you use more frames because when something is going fast they just sort of zip from one point to the other you don't really need to add a lot of drawing to that but okay this animation is pretty bland right it just evenly goes from one side to the other so in the real world things don't really move like this right things gain and lose energy so they accelerate and then lose acceleration they they slow down to a stop or when something if you think about a car i think cars are a very good example because when you stop you don't just straight up stop right you you slow down it's not like this ball which from in one millisecond it's moving and the other one it's not so to make things smoother generally we do something in animation that's called easing in or ease, easing in and easing out also known as slowing in and slow out, depending on, depending on, I don't know, the academy that people go to, the vocabulary can be a little different, but they're basically the same thing. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to duplicate this animation. So I have the same amount of frames and the same amount of time. I'm not going to change the timing 
but I am going to change the spacing of these frames. What am I going to do? I want this ball to slow out, so it's going to come out of this position slower and then slow in. It's going to go into this position slower as well. And we do that by bringing the drawings closer to each other. Remember what I said, when things are closer, they're usually slower. When the drawings are, are closer, I mean. I'm going to always keep the, these exposed so I can kind of get an idea. And I'm sort of, sort of going to increase the distance more and more. With this example, I sort of I like to work back to front. And with each drawing, the distance is increasing between one and the other. And the, uh, this one is sort of in the middle. I think this is going to work nicely. Now we didn't have many in-betweens here. We can probably add some frames. Or we can just sort of space this out a little better so it's not that choppy. All right, I think that worked pretty well. Let's loop that again. And as you can see now, th this is a lot smoother, isn't it? It just feels more natural. And almost everything in animation has this. It does this almost on every, on the beginning and the end of most movements. Always keep in mind, usually on the very beginning of a pose, the first drawings are closer to each other. Obviously, this is just a very general, a very general rule and if you do this too much sometimes things can look a little strange but it's something very important and you might think that oh because this one is moving slower in some bits it's gonna take longer right but that's not true as I said the timing is still the same so if I put them next to each other I'm gonna press this button that is edit multiple frames. I think we've talked about this before. Oops. Turn on the camera. We don't want to talk about the camera yet. And now I'm going to do this with this one as well. We'll just select the layer to choose all of the frames. And then we can see the, the drawings clearly even. They may be spaced out differently, but we play both balls reach the end together at the exact same time so it's sort of an optical illusion and that is the most basic timing and spacing sort of example that I can give but Easing in and out and this sort of thing, it's not just to make things look better. It's also, it has to do with how things move and how we actually see some things. And what I'm talking about specifically is perspective. So, this is when, this is what I mean when I say that when you're an animator, you really need to just pay attention to how things move in real life. You're, you're going to start looking at the most trivial things in your life, you know, like a bouncing ball or how someone waves their hand. And so the example that I like to see a lot is when you're looking at something that is spinning. So just it's very it's very hypothetical, right? But imagine there's like this floating ball. Actually, I'm just going to draw an actual circle. I feel like that's going to be wiser. And I'm going to... Wait. I'm going to use a black line. Use gray. No filling, please. Okay. 
Okay, so we have... This is just sort of the trajectory, right? And... Let's see. Make this a little smaller so we can... Like this. I need some space underneath. I don't really need to use the, the canvas, right? It still goes beyond. Anyway, so there is this ball and it's floating in space and it's just going around in a circle. And for this example, it's moving evenly, right? So it's not accelerating or anything, it's just evenly moving around the circle. Trying to eyeball this a little. I think I increased the brush size by accident, but okay. Create another layer. Okay, sorry. I was getting the buttons wrong. But so this is let's say this is the top view so if you if you're kind of having a bird's eye view this is the trajectory it's following it's spiraling around but what if you were looking at this straight so if we flatten this the circle is just going to be a line right and the extremes are going to be here and as well as, you know, it's going to be in front and all the way on the back. But I'm not even going to talk much about the whole, the difference in size. We can even kind of get away with making them all more or less the same size. So let's say you're trying to animate a ball moving around, but you're looking straight at it. And so you think, okay, so this, these are the two extremes, and now I need to, in between this, I need to fill these out to give that impression. So between this one and this one, this is the middle, right? Wrong. Because it's moving away from you, and the more it moves away, it's no longer moving very much horizontally to you. I mean, yeah, horizontally. It's not moving much across your eyesight but when it's moving here it's kind of moving like inside right the whole like physics arrow little thing it's moving away from you and not as much there's not much space it's going through for in your perspective so if we draw a dotted line right because i made them more or less on the same distance if we draw a dotted line, the midpoint between this part and this is actually closer to the edge. So, okay, let's animate this, right? So, I'm gonna do this somewhat roughly. And then this one is here. And I'm probably gonna time this out differently, but for now I'm just I just usually do everything in twos. Just to get right now I'm not even thinking about the timing of the drawings themselves, but mostly about the spacing. And then sort of the same thing all over again. And then here. And here. And that's pretty fast, but you can kind of imagine it's it's spinning around, right? It's doing this but you're only looking straight at it and it slows down slightly on the edges. And that's why 
spacing isn't just an effect. It it really it really is all about how things move in real time, and it, you have to be. And timing is is the thing where when something is moving slowly, you need to actually detail things a lot more. Now, as you can see, the middle the middle drawing kind of disappears in the middle of this animation because it's going so fast. Now, that's the thing. If you want to, you want this to be more visible, but you can't really add more drawings, right? Because it's, you're gonna mess up the, the timing if you do that, because the more drawings, the more frames you actually add, you're slowing things down. So something that we can do is make an alligate, alligated in between, which basically is going to mimic motion blur. So what is motion blur? It's something that originated from video cameras, right? Because if you capture a movement that is too fast, you're, it's gonna have a smear because the camera captures something in move, mid movement, right? So it's not gonna be perfectly on one location. So with this frame, because a lot of animation is also a lot about this illusion as if something was captured with a camera. Oh wow, what was that? <laughs> because that's kind of how we've gotten used to things moving as well. It's taking a little long. Let's see how this looks. Oh yeah, it goes back as well. Here, can sort of do the same thing. Wait, gotta erase this as well. And you see, th these drawings are very rough. It you don't need to be that that perfectionistic with really simple things like this. So obviously it's not perfect, as I said, but you kind of get that idea that it's zipping through your eyes and your eyes can't really capture all... Whoops, I banged my microphone. So with this elongated drawing or a sort of stylized motion blur and... Um, yeah, okay, let me do that again. So with this elongated drawing or... It also can be seen as a stylized form of motion blur. You don't necessarily need to do that. You could do these little air lines as well. But this is this is very reminiscent of very traditional animation. You know, you see this a lot in old cartoons. It's sort of mimicking how your eye sometimes can't capture a full image. This isn't only about cameras, honestly. It's something that we perceive as well. So it really get, gives more, I guess, impact to your animation. And so with this sort of spacing thing in mind, you can really, this is how you also give a more believable idea to whatever movement you're making, because let's say something is hitting a wall. That's another good spacing example. So you're drawing, I was looking at an, an animation it was the the woodpecker character so you know this character was thrown against the wall and you know it got all the way and then poof he he hits the wall and we're gonna get into squashing and stretching in the next lesson but you've probably seen if you've seen a lot of of old cartoons you see a lot of this very exaggerated um movement of things so Obviously, you know, on that scene that it was originally thrown, the character probably, you know, gained some acceleration. So it, you know, was closer here than it sped up. But it, because it's suddenly hitting something, it's not going to slow down. So that's what I say. You can't take it on face value that everything eases in and out because it's not going to ease in here. It's suddenly going to stop. And something you can even do to make it even stronger is actually just keep accelerating him. Maybe he doesn't even need that, but animation is a lot about exaggeration. And that's actually a principle. Some principles of animation are a bit more vague, and I think exaggeration is one of those. 
Of course, we need to keep in mind how things move in the real world, but in animation, especially in very... Actually, it's not even limited to cartoony things. Even on more realistic animations, we kind of need to push things a little. And I don't know, it just sort of... It seems more believable. I don't know, it just, it just works <laughs> most of the time. So yeah, let me see if I can actually animate this on the go. So I'm already going to do a little bit of maybe sh squashing. Oh, I only have behind. So it's going to start slow. Okay, let me do that. And it's going to start sort of smearing as well, right? Like, I'm just really winging this, so I'm not. And here's going to be the wall, sort of, actually. So this is another bit of a trick when it comes to... digital stuff, you know, if something's going to be static, just draw it on another layer. It's going to be exposed all the time. You need don't need to keep drawing it all every all the time or copying it. Just put it on a different layer so it doesn't need to keep getting replaced. And then poof. I don't know, something like that. <laughs> I wonder if that's any good. Yeah, it kind of worked. Look at that. <laughs> so I'm not quite used to straight ahead animation, which I'm already spoiling a few of the of the concepts because I, I think it's very important also to, you know, become familiarized with these. But look at that. <laughs> that's kind of funny. If you imagine someone, like an imaginary person, throwing this whatever it is, a sticky ball onto a wall. Yeah, it kind of looks fine. So as you can see, I really stretched that out on the on the end because you really want that impact to, to hit. You know, if I just kept it, you know, just a straight little ball, it wouldn't be the same. So a lot of the time, you know, I kind of went, you know, just every single frame and I just drew one after the other. But you don't need to work like that. And I usually don't because I'm just sort of playing around with animation right now. But if it's if it's useful to you, you know, you can first draw the first where it's going to start. OK, so it can be very helpful for you to sort of lay down the most important poses and even the trajectory because i got things pretty straight but sometimes that can be kind of hard even i thought it would be a lot wonky a lot more wonky i mean so you can get a different you know on a separate layer you can grab a different color and you know oh, this this ball is going to be thrown on this direction so you can always have this guideline and you know draw the first pose first and you know skip a few frames draw the last one so you can kind of have an idea, you know, on the first, on the beginning of this lesson, I, when I was spacing that first little ball, I didn't work exactly from start to finish, right? I kind of went back. Let me actually find it. Yeah, these two, right? Yeah, the top one, I mean. <laughs> So when I was adjusting the frames to get that, you know, ease in and out effect, I, you know, started in the beginning, then, then I adjusted the end, and then I just sort of filled in what needed to be fixed. And so animation doesn't, you don't need to work in chronological order as well, is what I'm saying. And yeah, those are the basics of timing and spacing. And this isn't the only moment I'm going to talk about it. As I said, I think this is probably the most important thing. It's always there. It, I feel like timing and spacing is animation. That's basically what it comes down to. So I'm always going to, you know, I'm going to show so many, so many examples along 
these next um, these next lessons that I feel like the principles they kind of stack o- on top of each other as we know we I'm gonna add squash and stretch on the other one but there's still gonna be timing and spacing and then on the next and the next we're just gonna keep adding more and more elements to these animations we can even continue using this example of something going from one space to the other but keep adding more principles and in the end we might have i don't know like a character running so in the end we might have a character running but all of these things all of these basic you know little ball zipping from one side to the other it's still gonna be it's still gonna come down to these same principles all right so see you in the next lesson bye bye hello for the next animation principle I'm going to talk about squash and stretch. This is also one of the most prevalent principles and techniques that you can see in hand-drawn animation. So it's it comes from the concept that things in real life, unless it's like made of stone, but especially more organic things like humans themselves, which are, you know, they're flesh and bone, so no matter what you're talking about, a lot of things are a bit squishy. And obviously for us, it's a lot more subtle, but this concept was taken into animation to make things seem a bit more fluid and natural. Um, But in animation, of course, it's a bit more exaggerated. But it can really, it can really give this this feeling of volume, and it, it seems more real, right? Like it has a mass of its own. But there are a few, let's say, rules about it. How to how to make it how to make it look right? Because sometimes, if you exaggerate too much or don't really keep some things in mind, when you squash something too much, they might be they can look. I don't know too wide and weird or if you stretch it everything looks skinny and brittle so a famous example to sort of introduce the idea of squash and stretch is thinking about the half how was it it's a half filled bag of flour (laughs) so you think of a bag of flour, right? If it's just sitting on the ground, it's it's kind of like a pillow. So there's those little little corners like a pillow and it's just kind of sort of distribute its weight on the bottom and it's going to stretch to the sides. And if you were to grab it from the top and lift it from the ground it would stretch to its maximum capacity but it would always keep its volume right no matter no matter how you grab it or how you twist it it's still the same bag of flour so it needs to keep a certain proportion even when you're drawing. So some people actually use the actual bag of flour in animation exercises. Draw a bag of flour falling, or some people even give life to the bag of flour and make it, you know, make it walk, make it jump, or whatever. It's actually a really fun exercise. So what I mean about something keeping its value is that, as I drew on the beginning of the class, you know, if, if you have this little ball, and, and you can kind of imagine it as a ball of dough, right? So if you were to squish it, it's going to get smaller on these sides, but it's going to get wider on the horizontal part. So you always sort of have to, you know, ex- explore the proportions so that they always look right, more or less. Because sometimes some people, especially beginners, they might forget that, you know, you have to sort of compensate on one side so that it doesn't lose, actually lose its shape. And this is very good, again, to make some movements seem more fluid. So I'm going to go back to the good old 
bouncing ball and show a bit how this can aid in the in the movement as well so before actually animating i'm going to set a sort of traject traject oh my god i'm going to sort of set a trajectory for the ball I'm not going to go too far, just from the top and then going back. Or the opacity. Lock it. Okay. So, let's think about the main poses, right? So when it's at the top, also, when you're doing squash and stretch, you should also keep in mind when to do it, as in the actual timing of your animation. Think about really the fix physics of it. If this were, you know, stretchier than it was really in, in real life, when would it stretch? When, it, when would it squash? When would it return to normal? So a general, you know, thing to keep in mind is usually on the most important poses it's going to be more or less back to normal because as we'll see in, in later principles you know you need to really make things really clear as in the staging of a certain movement or a scene so you want your audience to understand what's going on so when it's slowing down and the ball has you know when it when it bounces back up it's going to lose that energy and at some point it's almost going to stay still, right? The whole thing about how gravity and the weight sort of cancel each other out. And this is a moment where it kind of sticks a pose. So, and also thinking about, as I said, about the physics of it, because, you know, the forces are sort of canceling each other out. There's no reason for it to be stretching or squashing because it's just on that on that point where it's not really affected by anything and let me see something okay and the the new update kind of already adds frames to the other layers which can be fun but i'm still getting used to it but sometimes if i was setting a guideline like i did here you would Want to add a bunch of frames so that it wouldn't disappear as you go so before we actually i'm not really gonna do all the frames one by one i I'm, I'm going to set the key poses which is basically just these two really and and then i'm going to work on on this one and i accidentally copied this one back all right oops like that actually I'm gonna start animating just in twos all right it's not that predictable there we go Okay. <laughs> I'm confusing the buttons. So it's going to start nice and slow. And you know, in the beginning, you still want it to sort of stick that same shape because it's not for a single frame that we're going to actually see its its shape right you have to hold it for a few for a few draw I mean, sorry you have to hold it for a few drawings so that your eye can really perceive what's going on oh sorry
And honestly, it's only going to stretch closer to the ground. Now that it's accelerating, I still want it to, to look harder, let's say. And what was that? Okay. So of course, when you're animating, you also want to think what what your character, what your object is made of, so that it looks more convincing. Because if this was a bowling ball, then I would probably not add almost any squash and stretch. Definitely not as much here. Though, even though in real life, you know. A bowling ball would never really move like that. You might you might also want to actually you know just slightly squash it a little bit because it's not much about if the material actually does that, but it's kind of again a trick of the eye to sort of again it's, it's like an ex exaggeration. It might make the hit look a little bit more convincing. So I'm gonna see, I'm gonna try and add a little bit of stretch right now, but we'll see how this goes. Because, so basically what I have in mind is that at the very end, it's going to stretch a lot. Because again, it will sort of make this land a little better. Now I think this one is, not very, I think it needs to be a little skinnier. And I'm gonna make pretty much the same shape again. Let's see how this is going. Okay, now I can really s speed up. So again, just kind of take the distance between the drawing and the other and increase it. Hmm. Let's see if this will work. So already adding some, some tricks to this. When something is hitting the ground, be it a ball or you could do a, a frog jumping or whatever. Generally when something is contacting a surface, when it's actually on the first contact, you want it to actually touch that place because depending on the spacing of your animation you might think like oh actually it would it would end like the last frame before contact will like end right before here and the next you know it'll be on the ground but it's one of the things that will make it look a little bit more satisfying to to the eye is making sure that there's at least one frame that is making that contact. Oops, no. Now we keep going. I'm gonna add a lot more frames just to make sure I'm not running out. And on the next frame, uh, you don't really need to make it contacting as well. It might actually look a little uncanny. So next frame, you want to you want it to already have left the ground. Obviously, it it depends on how fast you're making this object move. But generally speaking, on something that is moving fast, like bouncing or quickly jumping. 
and you know can always adjust the position of this as well I think that's all right and here there's not much acceleration to be to be had like it's it's gonna bounce off of the ground and it's already gonna it's still gonna be pretty pretty fast And uh, as I was saying on a previous lesson, like you don't want to ease in and out of every position, right? Like you don't have to do much easing from the point it kicks, right? F from the point it bounces, I mean. It's not going to look like it's bouncing if you make it slow down, you know, start slow from here. Maybe this isn't very accurate. Oh, I'm drawing into the same drawing. Whoops. Forgot to add a blank frame. As you can see, like, this needs to be a little fatter. Because it seems like it's just shortening. And you know, thinking about the position of a drawing while also thinking about timing and spacing, it can be kind of tough. And honestly, I'm not quite used to this. So yeah, you might also, a thing that you can actually do, and I should have done actually is, um, for example, think only about the timing of this. So just draw a rigid ball figure out the timing and spacing of this just don't think about this the stretch the stretch and squash and then kind of you know do a very rough no need to make the lines all perfect and then go over that since you've already established exactly where each drawing will be then you just have to kind of go over it and and just fix that that squash the squash and the stretch I'm not doing this right now because it's just like a circle and it's easily adjustable but if you're doing a whole character for example you might go you want you might want to actually fragment and do things one one piece at a time And here in the end, for example, I, instead of two frames, I held it for three. It's very subtle, but sometimes, you know, you don't need to keep this timing exact all the time. Especially when something is slowing down, it might be easier to actually, you know, space out, space the timing out in between frames. And yeah, I think it looks pretty satisfying. I love watching these things over and over. <laughs> Honestly, I think bouncing balls are just so nice to look at <laughs> in animation. So yeah, and this, you know, it, it can go on for so many different things because when it comes to character animation, this can be very effective on faces as well. A very good example is when a character is chewing. Now, I'm not quite sure if I'm going to pull off a character chewing, like not actually animating, but... So anyway, I'm just going to stick to, you know, 
the smiley face. But if it was chewing, you know, the mouth would go up and, you know, the whole face would kind of go with it. So the jaw is going to go up. So I can kind of, you know, squash a little bit. And then when it's opening its mouth, and this you can really see when you're doing this on the mirror as well. It, it just looks really sad, but you know what I mean, right? When you do this on, when you're chewing in front of a mirror, sorry, this, <laughs> this drawing looks really dumb, but um, you can see how, you know, your nose gets pulled down by the mouth and all that, but when you're when it comes to animation you can really just kind of do that to the whole face and stretch it out you know so this might happen again when it's fr when they're frowning or when they're smiling even you know they can really pull those the cheeks outwards and the the face can kind of squish a little bit um and let's say a character is stretching or even when with every especially with very strong movements you can apply that to anything. So, you know, if a, if a, a, if it's, if someone is stretching their arm really far away, instead of, you know, this is their arm, you can like kind of taper the, it a little bit on the ends. <laughs> Again, sometimes it's good to think of things. With, oh my God, that hand, but you know what I mean. Kind of think the things are made out of rubber. Obviously, don't go too far with it or it might look a little bit too gimmicky, but if that's also your intention, then go for it. But, you know, you don't need to go get too anatomical about this, but you know, again, you have a stretched arm and they fold it. So here's your elbow. So because your forearm is going into, you can actually pull the skin back a little bit and that's kind of a stretch or a squash, you know? I can really give some form to the characters and objects that you're, that you're drawing. And as I show more examples, I think it's easier to go up, to show as we go. But this is a very simple yet very effective effect to to stay to keep in mind. <laughs> Sorry. So yeah, that was squash and stretch, and I'll see you on the next one. Bye bye. Hi again! Congratulations on getting this far. I hope you're enjoying this course and starting to see some great results. If you liked the tutorial so far and would like to check out the extended version of the course, head to the description box below where you will find our full Adobe Animate Beginner to Advanced course with more than 20 lectures and many more projects to complete. Now, let's continue. Hello. So on this video, I'm going to talk about straight ahead animation and pose to pose animation. Now, this principle talks about the main methods of animating. So these aren't rules but just methods and everyone has their own way of animating of course but these are the most simple but these are the two main approaches of animation. And spoiler alert there's actually a third one but <laughs> let's get to the main the main concepts. So First off, what are these methods, right? So you might might have heard me already mentioning some terms and mentioning this principle when I talk about in-betweens and keyframes and all that. So, okay, straight ahead animation is a lot what I've been doing on those real-time animations that I'm doing to e exemplify some, some concepts. So basically I go, you know, I draw the first drawing, then I go to the next frame and I draw the next one and I go, you know, as, this, as it says, straight ahead. I don't do much planning, I just kind of go with the flow and draw one thing after, one frame after the other. 
whereas post to pose it implies more planning so you draw a key frame or a key pose at first then draw the next you know important thing that's going to happen and then you know time it out you know there's going to be you know many frames that are going to be empty and then you go and fill in as you go and you know you don't have to go frame by frame you can kind of go back and forth until you've filled in the entire animation and i've kind of done both of these things on the past videos and you know there's an actual name for them and it can be a very conscious decision as to you know which approach you're going to choose for a determined animation so as you might imagine there are a few pros and cons to each of these methods so i'm mostly just talking about you know the pros in this so you know straight ahead as you might imagine you know it's very fluid it's very spontaneous and it can be very artistic and expressive but you know you can kind of lose the point of a scene you might not be able to you know let's say a character is moving from one point to the other and might, sometimes you can't really land the right the right you know spot that your character is supposed to 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 arrive at you know sometimes you can't really as as it says you can't really plan ahead very well sometimes so you might not really reach the very exact points you might want your character to reach it's not very you know you, you can't really plan ahead so sometimes you might miss the mark a little bit whereas post to pose is kind of the opposite you have a lot of a, a lot of control you can stage which is a, a principle we'll get on later but you know you can make things clearer and if there's a very specific very specific thing you know visually that your scenes needs needs to have a, a position or a certain movement you can really you know pick it apart and generally it's very it's a lot better for very complex animations so be it you know a character that has a lot of detail to it like very flowy hair or flowy clothes usually things that flow around your character they're very they become they can make your scene your animation very complex to tackle so as I've been saying, you know, you can do one thing at a time and, you know, fragment your animation a lot better with pose to pose. And, you know, I, I talk a lot more about pose to pose because it's, you know, it's, it's more complex than straight ahead. Straight ahead is just what it is. You just go and do it. And pose to pose is, as you might imagine, better for more commercial projects. So if you're, if you have like a TV show, especially TV shows, they work on a very tight deadline and, and budgets. So with pose to pose, you can, you can tell how long a scene is going to be. You can already time it out before you even get to filling out all the single frames that, that still, that still are left, right? So generally straight ahead is not used very much in the most, the most commercial and, you know, the, the more normal industry, I mean, animation industry things you see. But straight ahead is very good for very, for very artistic and I guess abstract animations, you know, people that just work with a much more abstract and sort of experimental animation. It usually involves a lot more straight ahead animation. So it's still present, you know, but you just, it's kind of on a different scene in animation. So I'm going to show some examples in, that I've already animated in my short film, because the truth is you can't really do one or the other. Usually what we do when we're animating is a bit of a mixture of both. So I'm going to show one that is a lot more pose to pose and another one that leans a lot more to straight ahead and one that you know kind of mixes both so this is just the rough version of a scene this girl is walking up behind this fence and she's going to kneel and look into the fence so it's flashing like this because the animator I have I had an animation team behind this he like deleted sort of 
the in between spot so he could animate. He didn't really need to do this, but some people did this. And so it's a lot more choppy, right? It's not, especially over here, you know, you see she like snaps directly to the next pose. So this was a very pose to pose approach. This whole project, I went like this because it's, again, pose to pose is a lot better when you're working with a team. So then the animator went in and in between this. See this? Yeah, there you go. And now it's a lot, a lot smoother. And, oops. And in the end, I, you know, finalized everything and it's nice and smooth. But even like that, you know, when you're doing the in-betweens, you're basically doing straight ahead animation. Usually what we do, we get, you know, the main like over here, obviously it's very few frames, so it's not even that straight ahead, but some people, you know, they have a lot broader keyframes and they just kind of, you know, plan out, you know, the starting and the ending point and just kind of go straight into straight ahead animation until they complete uh, whatever movement they want. And this was a scene that is a lot more abstract. It's from the same short film. It's actually really simple, but again, I just, you know, I think straight ahead can some, sometimes just be called winging it. And it's like a dream. So there's these trees, they grow out. Then there's this little, these little glowing eyes and they disintegrate and that's it. And I didn't really, I didn't really do any sort of pose to pose in this. I just, you know, I had this blank thing and I just, you know, timed out these drawings. And it was really simple, but a lot of people do these abstract animations with things moving around and they just kind of do, you just kind of go and let the drawings take you. And then with the eyes, again, I did a lot of these sparkles in the film. And again, I feel like effect animation is also something that uses a lot of straight ahead because it really has a lot of fluidity and it's very, it's very organic and effects, they have to be organic. So when you're doing, you know, sparkles, be it, you know, like fire or water or whatever, straight ahead is usually how you go. It's really hard to plan out these things. You kind of, you know, let the randomness be part of it. And it's really satisfying to make. And much like one in the previous lesson, you know, when I animated this bouncing ball, it was very hybrid, you know, and I guess even leaning more to straight ahead. But remember that, you know, where was it? Sorry. Yeah, you know, this is... Sometimes people, when they do straight ahead, they might not even, you know, plan out when it comes to this. This isn't really, this doesn't qualify as, as pose to pose, but what I'm saying is that straight ahead doesn't need to be just winging it, you know, it's, it's just a method of working. So, you know, you can chart out the trajectory of something moving and then just straight ahead it, you know, um, even though I did actually... Yeah, I drew this little squishy ball before so I could kind of have a gauge as to how much would it stretch and how much it would go back. So the truth is it's not as rigid as, you know, looking at the concepts might seem. And everyone has their own way and you kind of have to adapt depending on what you're working on, basically. So yeah. That was a little bit on animation methods and see you next time. Bye bye. Hi. So for the next principle, I'm going to talk about arcs. Now, as usual with animation, it's a very simple thing, but it's it really adds more realism and makes your movements more accurate when you think about these. So this principle, it basically points out how Pretty much everything in the world, every movement, most of these, these movements, they follow an, an arc-shaped trajectory. Things don't usually move in a straight line. 
And if you if you think if you end up animating things too straight, they will look very robotic and they won't look real or natural. So as an example, as I've kind of already teased with this little icon, to think about arcs is like thinking you're animating a stick. And it's going to go from this position to this position, right? So in the middle, obviously, you're not going to draw it like this, right? Because this is obviously wrong. You can tell that it shortens, right? Because things move in an arc. So this is a very obvious example and it works like this because it's physically limited to this shape but this example kind of is is good to imagine this when you're when you're animating so i'm talking about another example it's like if you're if you're animating in a hand and they're sort of pointing at something so Let's just imagine this is like a hand with a pointing finger. And it's going to, again, just sort of move and, and point at something. So if you even do this, this motion with your own arm, you know, I think a lot of these, you know, it's very common for animators to act out their own animations, as simple as the movement may be because it, it makes you realize how it's actually done. And so if you're in betweening, you're you might end up just making exactly like well an in between, like oh well then I'm just gonna trace right in the middle, right? But okay, you'll have in between a drawing, I guess I wouldn't say successfully, but it'll be animated. But When you're when you're making this, so you know there'll be the arm and all that stuff. Think about again animating this in an arc, and I recommend watching cartoons and seeing how much they actually do this. And again, in animation, it's these things are usually very exaggerated, and because exaggeration is a very important part of animation, and it just makes things a lot more appealing. So you know. It doesn't have necessarily have to do with, as I said, physical limitations like this one that I said. And actually even, you know, the arm thing when you're animating a hand or whatever, it's also it also has to do a little bit with that, right? It needs to still move within the axis of your elbow and there's just so much of a movement that can be done without actually generating an arc. But you can create create arcs with pretty much anything you're moving. So this on itself is a really simple principle. Honestly, there's not there's not much to say about it. Um, but it's it's good to remember when it comes to in betweening because in commercial animation, when you're working on you know a bigger project or something like that, there's usually a supervising animator and an in-between animator. So if you're either of those, this is when the arc can become a problem because if you're an in-betweener, you know, again, another just very hypothetical example is that, you know, if you have your keyframes over here, uh, an in-betweener might end up, you know, oh, it's going to move around like that, so, you know, you might end up, sorry. So the in-betweener will just fill in the blanks and go right here. But as you can see, we don't have an arc at all. It's going to be very, very stunted, very stuck. So it's important to always, as, as some animators say, watch your arcs. 
So this is something to keep an eye out when you're in betweening or if you're a supervising animator, anyway, you're the one creating the keyframes. Sometimes, you know, it's, it's good to help out your fellow animators and create guidelines. So, you know, you know, it's going to be moving in an arc and some, some animators might even mark out where spatially they want the in-betweens more or less. So this is something you might see in animation or and like this doesn't have to be just when you're working with more than one person. You can do this to, with yourself because as I said, the more guidelines. So because as I said on the previous lesson, the more guidelines you put on your, you know, your work in progress, the easier it's going to be. So might as well, you know. Um, so yeah, this was a quick one, but. I don't know. <laughs> All right, so this was a quick one, but as usual, very important. And I'll see you on the next animation principle. See ya. Hello. So today's lesson on the next animation principle is anticipation. Now, as the word says, anticipation is basically the action before an action. And this just makes things a lot more convincing and, as usual, just more natural, more uh, easier to understand, and all of that. So, what are examples of anticipation? Let's say the, the more classic examples. So, imagine you're gonna kick a ball, right? You're playing soccer, and as usual, there's always a ball in these examples. Um, you know, this also kind of goes down to physics, right? Because for you to successfully kick a ball and make it go far... Oh, I think my microphone kind of made a sound there. Okay, so imagine you're gonna kick a ball, and as usual, there's always a ball or a circle in these examples, but if you want that kick to be effective and, you know, you want the ball to go far, you're not going to, you know, have your your leg resting over there and then just suddenly, you know, kick it, right? Just move your head forward, let's say. Your, sorry, not head, leg. <laughs> so if you're going to kick a ball, you're not just going to, let's say, push your leg forward and touch the ball, right? That's not really going to make it go very far. There's not going to be a, enough impact. When you kick a ball, first of all, you, you know, go back so you can build up that energy and, you know, the further you start your kick, the more power is going to have to really kick that ball, that ball really far. So, you know, again, really obvious example, but this can be applied to almost anything. And even in real life, basically any movement, every action has some form of anticipation even if it is just that you're thinking about doing something before doing it unless it's a very unless it's a very ugh, unless it's a very automatic sort of response usually we think before we act and even that thought and that let's say sometimes you plan things out in your head before doing that that shows as anticipation it can show on a face you know, when someone is thinking through and their eyes might flick around and then they go and say something or do something. That is a form of anticipation. So anticipation isn't just about, you know, momentum or, you know, building up energy. It's also a thing that has to do with acting. Forgot to create a new layer here. So anticipation is also a way for the audience to understand what is about to happen. So it makes, let's say, the, the viewer is kind of, it is able to keep up with, with what is going on in the screen. So it, just, it can make things just land a lot better. It can be used for very simple actions. For example, if someone is looking at a drawing or, I don't know, a map of some sort, And they want to point at something. 
So let's see. Let's draw a little hand. <laughs> Why did I choose a hand for an example? There. So before they actually put down their finger to the to the page, they might probably, you know, lift up their hands and then touch the page. Here. <laughs> okay, that looked a little bit janky, but it it can make us it can make even the movement more fluid because you can. <laughs> Sorry, I'm like getting stuck. Let me just. Oops. Ah. Uh. Sometimes this can really... There we go. Okay. And not only the, does this make things a little bit more convincing, because if they lift the their finger, their hand up, and then point, it's, it kind of gives this idea that the person is, you know, sort of... Um, aiming where they're going to to point they might be thinking exactly what they they want to say what they want to show again it just looks a little bit more convincing and it also makes your your movements a bit more fluid because then you can kind of use the momentum of even if it's very slight of the hand just going up and then easing out of that position instead of it just straight up going down Okay, I'm going to try and give an example, but honestly, I'm not sure if it's going to look very good. So this can be even when something is very static already. Let's say someone is just standing still and they're going to start walking. So when they do that, the preference is that they don't just, you know, suddenly start striding. Even the position kind of looks a little bit awkward. So usually what happens is they take like a step before the step. And again, that is anticipation. They're going to give a little step outwards to create a better, again, a better position to actually start walking. And I'm just kind of keying these positions and yeah. And you know they I'm not gonna I'm not gonna animate a whole um, walk cycle, but you know what I mean. And obviously there are many ways to like take this first step, but again it's kind of creating momentum. So it's not always about going backwards before going forwards. It's just you know uh, again an action before the action, a sort of build up. That also kind of happens, but you know, anticipation, it really is more notable when, again, you go backwards before going forwards, or you go forwards before going backwards, you go down before going up, all that sort of stuff. It's really, it really is the, the best guideline, you know, just to kind of go to the opposite, to the opposite direction. So, yeah, but again, there are little things to keep an eye out for, these little you know, pre-actions, they're also, they are also a sort of anticipation. And as I said, sometimes if something is looking awkward, you're, you are moving your character, let's say, to a very awkward position to start an action again, to start that step, then maybe it's because something is missing and it's a moment for you to, let's say, maybe film yourself doing whatever your character is going to do and really catch those micro actions that we get sometimes. And again, 
as a sort of reminder that if there is an anticipation, there is also a sort of reaction to what is going on. So anticipation also, it also means that something can happen after an action is done. So if you have an, a bow and arrow, for example, oops. So sure, it's going to start here. Someone's going to pull it back. It should actually bend a little bit, but it's all right. And okay, the, the arrow's gone, so the action is done, but but your oh my god but the bow is not gonna just you know go back to its original position right away it's going to you know sort of shake a bit gonna have that little little reverb and i'm not trying to make the most accurate animation right now but that's also something not only does the anticipation sell an action but also the reaction to it and another thing that is part of this this whole anticipation um, concept is oh where is it yeah the the invisible anticipation so this is a sort of as, as the name sort of suggests, it's something that the eye doesn't really notice, but it's very effective and it's used a lot in video game animation, apparently, because it can sort of, it creates a snapping sort of effect. And I'm going to show a scene that I already showed here that was that more abstract sort of scene I created on the short film. So when these eyes show up and they open, you might notice that the eyes kind of blink before, even though they're already closed. Before they open, they sort of close even more and then they stay. So let's see, where is that? Here. So they were closed, they kind of go down a little bit, then up. And actually, now that I'm looking back, I should have probably done a follow through sort of thing, right? They should have kind of um, stretch a little bit before sell settling down on that final position. So, you know, when you look back on things, sometimes you notice things that could be better. But there was a little bit of anticipation and I knew that when I animated this, again, it's very minimal animation, but that literally just, you know, it's, it's one drawing, yeah, it's held by two frames, but basically a frame of anticipation but it makes things snap a lot better and that's the invisible anticipation it's sometimes just one or two frames and you can barely see it but it really helps and you know sometimes and the invisible anticipation is it can also be the anticipation of another anticipation it makes it snap even better so If someone's holding again a ball like on the on the on a baseball game before they actually you know do the the classic anticipation of going back and then throwing the ball let's see why is that doing that oh I I used it all in one one frame sorry about that so I'm going to draw that again, draw that maybe a little better. Okay, so they're just, you know, holding the ball, they're waiting for the moment. So they might go forward a little bit. And this can be just, again, a couple frames. It can go a little bit further.
And I mean, honestly, I think they can even... Yeah, you don't even need to be very minimal. This one is a, a more exaggerated sort of example. And this, this arm is really weird. I, I'm just going to accept that. So they're going to go forward, stay there a little bit, and here you can even, you know, make the, the arm sort of go, sort of start to bend back. sort of speed up a little bit and anyway so this is the person hasn't even thrown the ball yet this is all just a huge anticipation and it also makes it even more convincing so sometimes things have to go have to they need several takes of an anticipation before they actually commit to the action and I think that's very fascinating in a lot especially in games because the reaction to a certain input in a video game it needs to be very fast so that it doesn't feel like there's a delay from you know you pressing the button and then I don't know your character like doing a little sword swipe sometimes these anticipations they they need to be like really really fast and minimal and sometimes it's just a single frame and that's why you know video game especially more classic like uh cartoony video games they're they're very they're very snappy with their animation and it's actually very satisfying so you know pretty a pretty classic sort of small anticipation is when someone notices something right they're like looking And they even do a little bit of a squash. That's a bit off center. It's really exaggerated, but it's fine. I don't know if I'm going to fully animate this, but... Oh, okay. I accidentally made a new one. And then they actually hit that pose of... of surprise. Can even be very close. Okay, that was a little bit too snappy, or let's see. And then they hold the position. Again, there's a, a reaction to that. It's still going to stretch a little bit before settling down. And yeah, it's very, very simple, but it, it really makes things a lot more satisfying. And you know, depending on what's going on, you know, after they shoot up, they don't even need to settle down on the, the last position. They can still, you know, wobble even more down. Um, sort of how the bow and arrow works. You know, it, it can have several reactions after that. So those are the basics of anticipation and see you on the next lesson. Hi, so this lesson is about follow through or overlapping action. Those are just two names in which this um, principle is known for 
and it is very common in character animation and that is because characters usually have a lot of um, a lot of details about them whether it be clothing or their part or their body parts or something and so what happens when a character is moving and in most cases when you can actually see this is let's say a character is moving and they suddenly stop but not all things stop at the same time if let's say they have earrings the earrings might you know keep going they might you know wiggle a little bit when they stop moving or you know if they have any appendages such as let's say a bunny if this bunny was shaking its head you know to the other side you know the the ears they're gonna follow but they're gonna go through the action right that's why it's called follow through even though they are following the same action they might actually take a little longer to catch up so you know when they get to the extreme pose here to to the right you know the ears are going to flop to that side and then when the bunny goes back to having like their head straight the ears might still take a while to get straight again and realistically speaking they might even you know before getting straight again they might go to the other side right they might flop a little to the left before standing still and we even saw a little bit about that on the anticipation video because I feel like those two kind of go hand in hand you know there's the anticipation and then there's follow-through sort of the reaction of a movement so I guess it's a pretty simple thing to wrap your head about and so I guess it's a pretty simple concept to wrap your head around so I thought I would animate a little bit just so you can see I feel like it's good to just kind of see how it's done because when you're first getting started it might be a little bit overwhelming so something that has a lot of overlapping action is hair especially long hair you know if you ha if you're animating let's say a girl with really long hair it's it's gonna there's gonna be a lot of follow-through and you know hair is very flowy and light so I thought I would just animate, this would be a bit hypothetical, I'm just going to kind of make a, a floating head. So I'm also going to work a little bit with symbol animation here because I don't want to waste too much time animating the face. So with, I feel like with follow through and overlapping action, this is when we start talking about more complex animation. So I'm just gonna draw a cute little face. Okay. So I selected it, pressed F8. And I'm gonna turn this into a symbol, just gonna keep it a, as a graphic. <clears throat> Sorry. So I think I'm going to make her move to a side and then just kind of go back so that we have because you know follow through isn't just about when something stops it's as something is moving so I think I'm going to give her oops now, if you're going to edit a symbol you got to go into it again Okay, oops, <laughs> had the previous lesson open there. Right, now we have to animate this. Let's see, I think maybe a second might be, okay. So this is so something to be aware of when you're doing symbol animation is that is that different from frame by frame animation when you're making something move the keyframes are only let's say the extreme poses which is also another term for in animation you know extreme poses are usually your keyframes right 
even in frame by frame animation speaking because they're well key poses <laughs> they are important poses and when it comes to let's say motion and digital animation a keyframe is exactly that it's going to sort of dictate let me see i'm just thinking maybe i don't need i can i can animate the symbol on the root timeline because here yeah there we go we can just animate the symbol so yeah I'm gonna get into the the difference between those two things so let's say I wanted to go here and these are just keyframes and the rest are going to be in betweens but they're going to be sort of computer generated whereas when we're talking about you know technical names when I'm doing um, frame by frame animation you know um, uh, let's say I'm just animating a stick moving and I'm going to make it move I'm creating a whole new keyframe you know in the software these are all called keyframes and I thought I would just clarify because those are two terms that are kind of it's the same word for slightly different things so over here, these are all, when we're talking about, you know, the technical terms for the software, these are all keyframes because there are different, completely different and independent drawings. And if I were, call, were to call some of these in-betweens is because, you know, I made the extreme poses and then I'm drawing them, making new drawings in between them. And that's why they're called in-betweens. This comes from traditional animation. But in here, I'm going to do some tweening which is let's say the digital form of this so if i were to click here i'm just going to insert classic tween and it's going to do that for me so yeah this is a bit too fast let's see 15. i don't know I, i'm thinking of making it a bit more I guess um okay it's kind of hard with a pencil so you can just click and drag and you can adjust this. Okay, and in frame 24, I can actually copy the frame, I think. Let's see if we can just paste that. No, it's not the same. So create a new in between. I think we can click and drag. Okay. There are some technical things that sometimes I need to work out. Okay, it's more or less the same thing. So here as well, I'm gonna create a classic tween. And we don't need the onion skin quite yet. Okay, it's gonna do that, but I don't want it to be so aggressive. So I'm gonna create some easing. So over here on properties, we can cl click on classic ease. Let's see, yeah, ease in and out. And the quad is just kind of the the normal one. Honestly, I yeah, there's like bouncing animation. There's like a bunch of presets, but let's see, is that working? Yeah, there we go. Got to press enter. Ooh, that is fast. Might have to adjust that. I'm going to do this here as well. Let's see. Yeah, there we go. I'm going to now I'm going to add some <laughs> cuz that was a bit much. Oop. Got a bit lost over there. Okay. Cool. make this nice and even okay and it's good that we have some extra frames over here okay so because you know I'm gonna be hand animating this and I don't want this to be super long and tedious so I'm probably going to decrease the number of frames right here because now it's you know there's a new drawing every single frame 
And I'm not sure if I'm going to get around to really drawing in the hair moving because I'm going to animate the hair by hand because I think it's a bit more um, comprehensible, I guess. So I'm going to duplicate this just so I can... Um, just so I can, you know, have a backup. So I, I'm, I really want to just kind of get give a demonstration on this class, on you know, using using the software for a bit more of a, a more elaborate animation. Let me just check something. Yeah, okay, it's recording. All right. <laughs> so what we can do is you right click and yeah, convert to frame by frame animation keyframe each frame oh we can yeah every other frame let's see yeah that's interesting i didn't know it had this oh but it created an awkward one single here yeah, and this might actually i think i space them out a little bit too much and that's why it's so fast so what i'm gonna do I'm just going to drag them over to be a little bit closer. Let's see. Oh, that's eerie. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Okay, that's going to be a little bit easier to work with. 15. Oh, I see. I'm going to create uh, an even number. Yeah, there we go. Now we can make every other frame. It's a bit choppy, but I think it's going to make it a little easier to work with. So actually, because I did that, I'm going to copy it again because if I decide to, oops, actually animate everything. Let me just do that again. Every other frame. And every other frame. Okay. And I'm gonna animate the hair over here. And use a slightly different color. Slightly now, I'm gonna use blue. Okay. <laughs> okay. So before we actually start animating, let's define how this hair is gonna look like. I'm just gonna make it sort of how I did my one of my characters. Just has a bit of a bouncy a round sort of shape. It's gonna make things a little easier. Okay. And I'm gonna lock this layer so that it doesn't show the onion skin, or else it might look a little cluttered. Actually, yeah, I don't know. I think looking at the future one kind of confuses me. Let's see. I might turn this back on at some point. Oh yeah, I was gonna talk. What's the difference between animating in a symbol on the root timeline and inside the symbol? Well, it's basically, you know, a sort of, again, a, a, preservation, a preservation of the original drawing. Because if I click inside the symbol, can't do that because it's locked, you know, that's all the symbol is. And there's a keyframe in here, but I think that was just an accident. Yeah, I don't know why there is one in there, but it's still the same drawing, you know. The the animation isn't actually inside the symbol. Um, I don't really plan on making it loop, so it's not. there's not really much of a, a reason for me to do that. And just a reminder, you can actually put symbols inside symbol. So if I still wanted to preserve the animation inside a symbol, I could do that and still have this standalone symbol be its own symbol inside the other timeline. You can just basically stack things over each other all the time. But here I, you know, I don't intend saving this animation for future use or anything, so I prefer to animate it 
on the root timeline because then it's directly embedded in this timeline and not inside the symbol. So if I were ever to access the symbol inside this library, it's just going to be this drawing. Hope that made some sense. Okay, so let's get to overlapping action. So because the, this girl is going to shake her head, um, she kind of looks like a ghost when she's doing that for some reason, but okay. The overlapping action is going to start from you know, from the very beginning, you know, if I were to use this exact drawing every time, it will look stiff like she glued her hair in place or something. So when something as light as hair especially is dragging behind, already when she stops, when she starts moving, the hair is going to take a moment to, you know, sort of catch on to that motion. So. This part is directly at attached to her head, so there's nothing we can do about that. It's always going to be attached. But for the, mo for the most part, everything's just kind of going to kind of stay in place at the bottom. And yeah, as you can see, that didn't make any sense because it was <laughs> kind of going back. So if it's going to move, it's going to move with her for now. So we're going to try and make this still stay in place see still is already dragging behind her okay i'm not gonna yeah i'm just gonna keep the previous one oh this this frame already is starting to get far away so you know more and more it's gonna drag it's first going yeah also this effect is also called drag so there's a lot of terms in animation. Depends on what you're talking about, honestly. <laughs> it's kind of funny when you're animating, it looks like the hair just gave up in the middle of this. Still get making a drag quite a lot in the back. And again, this is a, also an example of that sort of hybrid animation I was talking about. I did a sort of pose to pose with this, though, you know, this was a lot simpler because I didn't have to draw, manually draw these in-betweens. And now with overlapping action, I think this is a moment where people use a lot of straight ahead animation when they're doing overlapping actions because it gives that fluidity and just generally it's a lot easier to work with but you know if it's gonna hit a very specific pose i might do that you know over here at some point i want the hair to really you know flip back i might you know just just key that you know draw the drawing i want it to be but i don't know i might actually just let's see There we go. Sometimes I like to already prepare some of these empty keyframes. <laughs> I always forget what the... Yeah, it's F6. So you can sort of just use your keyboard. And it can be really fast. Like that. And in the end there's going to be more frames for the hair, but for now I'm just going to keep it like that. You also have to be very aware of when when she starts slowing down because the moment she starts to ease into the second position, the drag is also going to have to start to lower. But again, kind of delayed. You know, it's still going to be speeding up. Even yeah, here she's already dragging. She you know hits that position, and she's already. But for now, there's not much of a difference. So you know the hair. The hair doesn't know she's slowing down yet. <laughs> you kind of have to, to think about it like that. Like it's not affected by, by her slowing down. And here she's already, you know, she has slowed down. 
But if you kind of see the distance between these, perhaps it can still be more or less the same, you know, it's still really, still dragging. And again, she's already, yeah, okay, she's already moved, started moving to the left. But the hair, it's still going, you, you have to think relatively in these cases, you know, okay, the head has gone to the left, but we know that it's not, let me, it's not very consistent. Okay, just get, kind of getting the height for that. Okay, so the hair is still relatively to the hair itself. It's still moving to the right. Here, still moving to the right probably. It's really going to shoot out the other side. It's going to go way beyond the point that she went, you know. Uh, again, it can be a common mistake because you know she can, she's gonna stop here, but the hair it's gonna it's gonna shoot back to the other side because there's nothing really stopping it. Like on the bottom, it's gonna be attached to the head on the top. Let's see. I still want it to go beyond that point. Let's see if that's too much. I don't think so. Yeah. Again, relatively, it didn't really move that much from this frame. Looking at just the hair, sometimes you can even, you know, can be even useful to look at just that. And here I'm just gonna kind of. I think it's gonna still go up a little. Oops. Oh man. Accidentally undid some of the stuff there, but it's fine. It's gonna go up a little bit. Yeah, there we go. And you know, I could have actually done some some stretching over here. Kind of wanted to keep it right right on the same sort of proportion, but this is when, you know, a squash and stretch can be pretty cool for the hair. Especially, you know, usually when we're animating, it's... Hair is usually just this one big mass instead of individual strands. So it's kind of like... It looks like it's made of rubber. And here, I think it's... You can kind of stretch it out a little bit because I think it became a little fat. I'm gonna just roughly erase some of that out. Oh wow, she stops pretty fast here. Okay, she's already she's slightly slowing down here. So if she's only started to slow down, the distance is, is barely noticeable here and the hair is still gonna go still going strong you know <laughs> yeah i stretched it out quite a bit over here i think it looks cool though let's see okay sh here she's already stopping maybe the hair can, can slow down a just a little bit make it a little closer perhaps Let's see. And here she stopped. But the hair is nowhere near of stopping, so you know it's still gonna go. And I don't even know how many frames I'm still gonna do. Oops, wrong one. Of seven to make an empty frame. And she took let's say two or three frames to stop, maybe the hair could take about four. Because the hair for being lighter and having a lot less control over its movements like the head, 
it's going to take longer to stop as well, especially because it's lighter. Let me think. Yeah. yeah. I could exaggerate this a lot more. I'm thinking Let's see. I don't know if that's going to look good. Oh yeah. Okay, I'm gonna add a few more frames to make it really like settle down here I'm gonna start slowing it down still gonna go a little bit longer I mean further away you know so it and it could actually hold maybe a frame or two let's see if it holds for four frames maybe just three you add that extra little frame and kit it can really and then it's kind of almost repeat that previous frame I think the yeah the, <laughs> the hair kind of became shorter over time but you know just some practice I'm focusing mostly on the movement rather than staying faithful although you know Obviously, staying faithful to the drawing is important. This little wave is probably kind of shortened over time, but... And then, it can even go further again. You know, give it that little shake. Okay, maybe hold it for just three frames. Let's see, should it settle down here? I think it should get an extra frame over here. So, whoops. <laughs> Add two frames, make a blank keyframe here. And now we can just look at these two. And I'm gonna create a, an in-between specifically of these two. I'm going to make it closer to the previous one than the last one. If I can, it's very minimal. <laughs> yeah, there we go. That's cool. Shift F5 to remove frames. And center that. Oh, that's cute. <laughs> I'm proud of that. Yeah, it, it gave a pretty cute bounce on the end. So, yeah, that was some overlapping action for you. And, yeah, I think that's my tip, you know. Just look at that onion skin and kind of see the relativity between, you know, the distance between frames. Because that's what telling what's telling you how fast or slow it's going. So if... The distance starts to shorten, it means it's going slower, so, you know, I knew that the hair still needed to kind of keep that same distance and only start to slow down later. So, as you can see, you know, I was going straight ahead with this animation and, you know, it went off model, as we say, you know, it, it kind of lost its proportions a little bit. Let's see, this is the last frame. This is, yeah, it really changed shape, um, which, you know, it's not, it's not that great, you know, but, you know, it looks pretty smooth, so you can barely tell, you know, if you're not paying attention to that. But this is another way that I actually didn't mention. Um, I, I said that wrong. So this is another uh, method that I didn't mention on that um, pose to pose or... Uh, straight ahead animation is that sometimes people you know exactly to to get that nice flow and you know organic feel let's say of this overlapping uh, action of the hair you know I could do exactly what I did right now just go straight ahead you know not thinking too much just really getting the flow of the movement itself and then as I said I noticed it went a little bit off model 
or you know not exactly off model but it changed shape over time so i would go and give it a second pass maybe kind of go post to post to make sure like i would you know draw over this one and then go over to this last slide in which it's not that that similar and on a new layer of course but then i would go and you know give it the right shape it was supposed to have so that when I'm animating these last few frames I have this reference of the ending point. I know how it needs to be exactly on that last frame to make sure that I didn't change the this, this shape or the size accidentally. So a lot of people do the straight ahead animation as a sort of test, you know, to use as a guide when you're actually cleaning up and that first straight ahead pass isn't even used in the final animation but it really it can really help you get that feel because sometimes post to post can be a little bit it can look you can really lose the flow because it might really look like you're going pose to pose instead of it being one single fluid motion so yeah i also wanted to talk about that um, when it comes to combining straight ahead with a more calculated animation it's totally a, a thing that you can do so yeah, I hope you like this more demonstrative sort of uh, lesson and I believe the next ones will become more and more like that. Just incorporating the principles over the other and we're going to start constructing, you know, more complex characters and making some little short animation tests. And yeah, I'm excited to see you on the next ones. See you later. Hi, so this video's principle is secondary action. So this principle relates a lot to character animation and what is what it is about is that when a character is, you know, portraying some idea, there are usually little actions, little gestures in its body that can help fortify that ex that action and that idea that they're putting out. So, for example, it's not just when someone is sad, but they might also try and, and how is it? Wipe a tear away from their face. I'm going to do that again. So, for example, a character can be sad, and not only you can see that on their expression, but they could be wiping a tear away. So, with that example in mind, you have to think that the secondary action, it's, you know, it's complementing, it's adding to that primary action. So you don't want to draw attention away from what is the most important because the primary action should be, you know, they're sad and they're wiping a tear away. But if their expression is the, the most important part of this scene, they shouldn't be, you know, covering their face, for example. The secondary action shouldn't take away the attention from, from the primary action. So it has a lot to do with acting and making, making, let me see. So this has a lot to do with acting and just making gestures and emotions more clear to the viewer. And again, this is, this just goes to add to a more believable performance and all that. So I'm going to show an example. I'm going to animate an example now. So I have this character and I want them to be upset about something that someone said or something that he sees. So to show this in a scene, so in an animated way, you know, if I would just, you know, keep him still and just change his expression, um, it would be, it would be very, very dull, right? There's a lot more that happens when someone reacts to something. So I think the, the first thing I want to, to make him do is just sort of take a step away. You know, when someone is shocked by something, they sometimes, you know, they take a step away to show that they might be, that they are upset or even intimidated by something. Um, here. Let's see, I'm just going to give some extra time here before the first reaction. Let me think. <laughs> this is 
way too tiny. Yeah, there we go. That's a bit more visible for me. So, I'm going to animate very, th very, oh my god. So, I'm going to animate many things in his face, but again, some people call this a building block method where, you know, let's just go one thing at a time. So, I'm going to just sort of time out, you know, the movement that his head makes before, before going any further. And I'm not even going to think about his ears, just really the head shape. So let's already keep in mind some some principles. I'm going to anticipate he's going he's going to, you know, kind of have also an arc. He's going to go sort of in this direction. But before before that, I'm going to just add Oops. F7. There we go. That anticipation. Now, I'm not sure if it's going to be just one frame. And honestly, I think I'm just going to copy this drawing and animate it. Okay, let me see. So basically, I just press, you know, Control C to copy and Control Shift V to copy it, to paste it in place. Oh my god, I keep pressing the wrong buttons. <laughs> there. So I'm just going to add a few frames just to a little easier what oh I'm pressing this wrong thing there we go so it's kind of weird because it, it feels like he's getting smushed but honestly I think it's just because the the ears are missing so it looks like he he's like flattening let's see the last one okay I'm gonna add how do I make it blank okay okay we go to the last frame and click on add a blank keyframe but then it does that to the last one Sometimes it can be a little fidgety. And, okay, I don't want to look forward. I don't want to look forward. There we go. I'm gonna really sort of ease. Ease this first one. No, I want to extend this. Thank you. Okay. I think he knocks. He goes way too much, but I don't know. Let me just keep animating this for now. I'm going to start making this a bit more dramatic. So I'm copying always the last one I made so I can put paste it on the last position. Okay. Copy, paste it. Now he's gonna start slowing down. Maybe one more. really sort of ease it ease him into the, that last position okay 
Honestly, I think this this anticipation went a, even a, a little bit too far. This is just sort of one of those very subtle. I'm gonna make him not go so much forward, but mostly just up. I think. I think that's gonna be. Yeah, I think that's better. So I'm actually. You know him step it, stepping back like this is already a sort of secondary and um, secondary action because you know the main action here is his expression he's going to you know he's gonna have an expression change um, so that's the thing this is only aiding to his reaction but when something is moving that's usually what we want to lay out first Let me think what's next. So maybe we should, you know, get out with actually animating his face. Now that I think about it, I probably should have actually animated his expression changing first <laughs> and then changing his um his spacing. But okay, so that's what I said. I kind of sh did a, a straight ahead pass of this. And what we can do is create a new a new layer and I'm gonna just copy this original drawing because it's gonna be my base for for the rest of the the animation his expression is pretty neutral but it's exactly because this is already serving as my reference for the character and that's the thing don't don't think that you're wasting time in testing things um, you know, usually with more complex things, you should thumbnail your drawings, which means, you know, making, um, how they call it, exploratory drawings. You know, it's not about, you know, getting the finalized, the final look of something, but, you know, exploring, laying something out. You need to see things to see how they work sometimes. So I'm going to lower the opacity of this or opacity, I don't know, so that, you know, we can then use this as reference. Uh, let's see, I'm thinking ahead a little bit. So, and then we, yeah, we're going to animate, um, oops, let's see. Then I'm gonna have to sort of. Okay. So I'm gonna like sort of spoil what I'm thinking, but I think the a, a pretty big secondary action that I want in this scene is for him to sort of lower his ears by the end of the scene. Is they're gonna be kind of like this. Uh, which, by the way, I think this is why, you know, these, like, animal people are so popular in animation because animals really, they have so much potential in their extra parts in their body, you know, like whiskers and tails and generally more expressive ears. Um, they just have so much potential and, and they can be so expressive. <laughs> and I kept thinking about a secondary action example and I just really wanted a character with like ears like animal ears because I think they are like a perfect example of this so okay I'm going to redraw again sort of I'm gonna lock this one so I don't actually I'm just gonna hide it and again because I know I'm gonna redraw the ears I'm not gonna bother with them now do that again because the the other you know layer that I made it is basically it basically turns into a guideline right just like sometimes, you know, with the bouncing ball, I, you know, drew the, the, the way, the, the path it was going to follow. I should, you should also, you know, create guidelines that are actually animated so that you can, uh, you know, 
get something out of your brain so that you have to, don't have to think about so many things at once. Talking about, you know, these guidelines, um, that is very, very useful when you're drawing something in perspective. So sometimes the character is coming up close to the camera, so they're going to be far away. They're going to, you know, increase in size. So please never animate that straight ahead. It's so hard. So a lot of the time, you know, people would literally draw these guidelines to kind of keep at like a low opacity at all times while they're animating so that they can always get, you know, like the proportions right. And they literally have these lines set out for them. So that's just a, a very, very classic example of animation guidelines. Anyway, wanted to put that out. Um, let's see, because... Uh, a good tip with secondary actions is, th is that don't time everything exactly the same. You know, like, oh, he's going to react exactly at the same timing that, you know, his head turns to the side. Uh, I might even do that now just to still, you know, kind of time things correctly, but then I might delay his expression a little bit. So I think he, you know, he can raise his eyebrows. His eyes are pretty much going to stay the same. But then his expression can become more neutral. And I'm not going to animate his whiskers either. Let me see. Um, nope. Uh, F6? Yes. And then... Maybe raise them just a little bit more. So kind of, you know... The character hasn't quite processed what just happened, whatever has happened. Um, oh, I think I accidentally added a frame over there. But I think it timed pretty cool. You know, gives it a little bit more time to start the actual movement. Now, when you, I like to work with pretty flexible frame rates like this. But you know, if you want to keep a steady frame rate, only like two frames at a time, that can also lead you to time and space things differently. Because you know, removing a frame from this kind of animation sometimes makes a huge difference. So sometimes it's good to have in mind what kind of animation, because I don't know, I might, I can imagine that sometimes there could be a limit depending on production stuff you know if you're working with a large team sometimes to have that fixed you know maybe 12 drawings per second can be uh, useful I'm not sure though and I usually work in 12 drawings per second uh, and keep the you know the animating on ones for really detailed and things that need to be really smooth and then you know you can add those ones in between and smooth out your animation but usually it's good to have in mind how how many frames you're actually going to use because then you know as I said adding ones after animating in twos can mess up your timing so there's always going to be some adjustments to make over there anyway when I'm drawing it involves a lot of just staring and just thinking for a large amount of minutes so for the whoever's editing you know feel free to cut out if I'm taking way too long but animation is a lot about you know replaying those two frames you drew a million times until So what I'm thinking is that this slight expression change can come even just like a single frame before when he's still not even moving. And sometimes, you know, when I said about that invisible, invisible anticipation, it can be a lot about that, you know, just break the secondary, the secondary actions by a couple of frames can give it a, a, a much more natural flow. 
So, okay. So his eyebrows are gonna start to slant. I mean, I could just... I'm just gonna redraw things, honestly. <laughs> With hand-drawn stuff, I don't mind. Just sort of lining things again. I should, yeah, from now on, I'm gonna copy this outline so I don't have to keep redrawing it. Now this, if I was, you know, animating this for something, this would still be a rough pass, so I'm not, you know, my line art is still pretty rough. So I don't mind, you know, having this sort of broken broken outlines and stuff. Uh, let me copy that. Okay, gotta remember to not end up copying something else. Okay, so the, the eyebrows, oops. They're gonna, you know, come a little bit. Lower the eyes are still. I still don't want the eyes to change much. Again, I'm sort of. I sort of want to break up the expression change a little bit. As for the mouth, yeah, I'm gonna make it. You know, I'm gonna make it sad. Now I think. I think it's important to really mark that. I think the the mouth can really. Okay, actually, yeah, no. The mouth changes. Oh, okay, so yeah, this was a little bit too dramatic. Cause I want this to be smooth. Um, let's make like an in between of that and the mouth as well. Perhaps this could be the next one, and this, wait, no, I want this one to hold. I'm just gonna, let me see, there, <laughs> I think that would kind of mess up the timing because here he's kind of stopping his head on the top so I don't want his expression to change in the middle of that and then his expression can start to change here but it's only really going to become clear on the next couple of frames and here I'm just animating everything in one place I'm not thinking about the head movement at all I mean, I am, you know, when it comes to the timing of it, but it's going to animate it all in one place. Okay, so now his eyebrows can... I don't really think the eyes it's themselves are going to change that much, honestly. Now the expression itself, I think, is going to be kind of subtle. And the eyes, I think, I want them to become a little bit wider, like that, and the mouth is going to stay pretty much the same. And here, I'm just going to give it that last bit of exaggeration, and I think this is going to be our final expression. Actually, I think this one. Wait. <laughs> I think this eye is going to move too much. Let's see. 
Yeah. His eyes kind of become wide and, you know, they kind of cross a little bit. I think that's a cute look. Okay. So I think this is good and we can actually make this head move now. So here's going to stay in place. I'm going to turn off the onion skin because we don't need that now. And I'm going to... I think I'm just going to use the arrow keys for these few first ones. And here... So it's going to move. I'm just going to insert a keyframe so it's going to be the same drawing but it's going to just move a little bit now I'm going to use the mouse let's see that Hmm, I think this anticipation is too smooth. I'm not sure. I think it's okay. Okay, so I think we could say this is the primary, the primary action, you know. Um, you know, he steps away and, you know, becomes upset. I think those are the most important ones. Uh, they kind of they kind of walk hand in hand. The 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 expression on itself, I think, wouldn't communicate as much. Let's save. Let me just check here. All right. I like to check every once in a while that we are recording because oh my god. Um, I'm gonna rename things. Okay, so now I want to animate the ears, which for me are going to be the, the big secondary action in this. And, you know, just to preserve things, make sure, you know, if I, if I really don't like the ears, I don't have to go back and animate them again. I'm going to do them on a separate layer. And it's going to follow the same frame rate, right? Like, I don't... With these things, if things are attached, you... It might be better to not have them, you know, diverge with the main frames. Whereas that can look a bit awkward. But, I don't know. Obviously, uh, like I did with that hair example, you know, it after it stops, you know, we can pretty much just go wild with the rest of the, um, the follow-through and stuff. But when, when there's not too much uh, overlapping stuff, you might want to follow the same sort of frame rate. So the ears already exist on that one. Okay, deadline. We don't need that anymore. Let me see. I think on the first frames, they're going to stay the same. Oh yeah, it's going to start moving, right? <laughs> It's the previous frame. I don't honestly I think it stays pretty much on the same. Yeah, the drawing doesn't change that much. I think it goes up a little. Yeah. Okay, so this is the same drawing, so I don't want to make it look really awkward, so I'm just going to paste the same one so that it, like, the ears aren't moving on their own. Okay. So, I'm going to add a bit of drag to the ears. So, he's going to start moving backwards, but I want the ears sort of to flop to the back. A little bit like that. Let's see. It's gonna give some some life to the ears for once. Like that. Yeah, and 
So it's going to end about here, you know, kind of look at the distances. But they're going to sort of flow to the back a little. And this one looks smaller. Like that maybe. And yeah, because of the um, the follow through, the ears I think they should settle on. Whoa. What? And the mate is being weird. Sometimes you gotta restart animate because it just decides to be weird. Yeah, I didn't like it. It didn't like the the main drawing to be. It was gonna give it a bunch of frames so that yeah, it's not gonna be that long, but just to make sure. I should really update mine. I think it's a bit glitchy since the last update. Always be careful with the Adobe um, updates because they love to mess up like the basic stuff when they decide to change it. Okay, yeah, the ear. So again, um, what was I talking about? Um, yeah, the, the follow through of the ear. Um, again, I think I want that secondary action to hit like a little after the main action, you know, the, the secondary action doesn't necessarily need to be at the same time, by the way, I feel like I need to make that clear. Sometimes it's something the character does before or even after the main action, it, it kind of, when it's done before, it's almost a form of anticipation, right? It, it makes it clear um, to the viewer what's about to happen. But when with overlapping, sorry, with secondary action, um, it kind of, you know, it can give some more personality to whatever your character is about to do. You know, like someone, I don't know, rubbing their hands before grabbing something, like they're anxious or excited to do that or whatever. So yeah, for the most part, I'm just going to do some follow through on this on these ears and not going to move that much, like independently. So, yeah. Now, yeah, the final. Oh, I drew on the wrong layer. <laughs> um, it's not that bad, actually. Just use the lasso tool. I want to keep it nice and separate, most for the most part. There. Just cut it with Control X. Control X it copies and deletes whatever you selected. I know copying is a pretty basic um, command, but I only learned it like pretty late in my digital art life for some reason. Okay, so here we are already independent, let's say, from the main drawing, right? So we can start. Um, yeah, let me just also extend this because it's kind of weird to keep adding frames when they don't exist. So I'm just gonna do that, you know. In animate, I always like to just create a bunch of frames to to make the timeline a little easier to to control. Okay, so here. From this point, this is when the character is actually going to move their ear so that they're droopy. Second, I need some water. Sorry, I'm going to even mute that in case it's uncomfortable. <laughs> Just thinking about how yeah we can even key this right so 
since everything's gonna stay in place, we can do this easier. So I want it to look like this, maybe. It needs to be more exaggerated. Yeah, something like that. It's really, really sad little ears. And we can add some frames just in case. Okay, now I want to look forward more than back. Ah! <laughs> we only have two frames, so. I don't know if this is going to be enough, but, you know, we can, since I know for now that, oh, there's only two frames to go, or better, two drawings to go, I can space that out a little better. So, again, remember the easing and the arcs of, st of stuff, uh, I don't want to space them, thinking about the tips of the ears, right? Um, I don't want them, ugh, I don't want them to be, you know, evenly spaced, I want them to ease, so maybe something like this, right? Um, the middle one, I mean, the second frame is on the middle of the, of the path. It's just some classic sort of easing tips. But let's see, I might add a different frame. And since I add, if I add an extra frame, I might have to redraw them because the timing is going to be different. I'm, I'm just thinking about the follow through if it, because I keep thinking they might Want to? I might want to make them bounce back before going down, but for this example, I don't know. So I'm still going to figure out how this ear is going to move. It's a bit of a, a long stretch of movement. And then it ended up kind of evenly spaced, honestly. But I don't want the... I want this distance to be smaller than the distance. So I'm gonna just edge it a little closer. Let's see. Hmm. Yeah, I wanted to wait a little longer. It kind of kind of goes straight away. I fe I felt like that was a bit robotic. So thinking wait there maybe. Maybe even more. I think I'm going to do what I said and now I'm going to make it bounce back a little bit. Get some follow through there. And here, yeah. Gonna make it go back to where it was. Right? Let's see. Yeah, that's cool. I actually think this one went too smooth. I think it's the it can be either this the spacing of the ears or maybe even the timing. Wonder if we get maybe just remove this one frame. I'm going to keep that frame on just a single one and 
I'm going to give this one even more of an ease. Just so that it sort of snaps. Yeah, and this one too. When something moves really fast from one point to the other, sometimes it's not like a problem that you don't, you know, you don't have to fill in every single position. Again, because if you draw every single position, you're gonna you're gonna get a really small you're gonna get a really slow <laughs> animation, so And having something literally snap to a position, again, it can make the animation really snappy and sometimes that's what you want. Yeah, that's cool. And again, some follow through. I'm going to make it bounce back just a little bit like that. This is going to be the actual final. I think. Yeah, very cute. Okay, so that, those were the ears. Um, oh, <laughs> one final frame there. And now the whiskers. So the whiskers, I think I want them to, they're kind of, they're gonna, you know, like kind of go down like this. Um, kind of in between, you know, when the arc is, the, the head is settling down, but before, I don't know. Or it can be more timed with, with the head. Again, I don't want to distract too much from the ears and the head moving. Because I think those are, again, the, the ears are another main point of this animation. So I don't want the whiskers to be, like, really... Um, I don't want them to draw too much attention. I might actually just animate <laughs> on the same layer as the ears. They're going to be sort of the, the complements. And again, on a more complex animation, you might want to maybe draw these with different colors so that you remember you're drawing on different layers or whatever but just for this example i think it makes it a little bit clearer okay i don't want to look forward yet these are going to be basically the same let me see already adding some drag see but not too much I feel like they shouldn't be that we just get the proportion of that okay so they line up with this little cross here oh they're dragging a bit they're like moving, they're, how is it? They're gliding a little bit. The ear, the, yeah, the nose kind of shrunk, but I think it stays pretty, pretty consistent after that, so I can adjust that later. Oh yeah, these are the same drawing, right? So I'm going to just copy these. Sometimes better to just have the same reference. There we go. Okay, so now, yeah. Again, I think the whiskers are mainly just going to be a sort of overlapping action. Sort of. Oh, 
Oh, <laughs> these glided a lot. Uh, I feel like they're... Yeah, it's kind of hard to keep these consistent. I feel like they're dragging too much to the side here. Yeah. And even with these, you can even stretch them out a bit here. Kind of like a motion blur. I don't want these to like bend over too much. I just kind of, I just kind of gonna do this. With something as thin as whiskers, you know, I feel like the squash and stretch doesn't need to be like, oh, so the the whiskers have to be thinner now that they're moving. Like, no, they're they're already so thin and almost abstract. Sometimes you can get away with just drawing them longer. Though here they're really thick, so that that like literally is the opposite of what we want. Um, let me just check. Yeah, that is decreasing the size. Yeah. I'm not sure about them like sort of bending into like that. Maybe they can just stay more like a little bit stiffer. And here they're going to start Settling down to their normal size. Oh yeah, I wanted them to shrink, right? Let me see. Yeah, on these final, it can just take like two frames or something. I think here actually they can start to shrink a little. Not shrink, like I don't know the word. <laughs> They're gonna start to move down a little bit here. Oh, actually, I should have, yeah, I should have drawn the whiskers on a separate layer because I'm going to have to keep copying them when they're standing still because, yeah, so, yeah, there's that, that, that was a mistake. <laughs> when in doubt, just, just draw everything on the same layer. Here, they're going to go down. Yep. And now I just can use my mouse and yeah, even if you're on one specific layer, um, it's gonna select everything, so just gonna lock the 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 base head one and gonna select only the whiskers and just copy them. Again, with a layer just for them, I wouldn't have to do this, but it's a short animation, so it's fine. Oh yeah, there's the neck. The neck isn't going to do much. Yep, that's pretty good. The, the whiskers just kind of follow the, the general expression, and then the, the ears do that actual secondary action. Whoops. Sorry. Um, okay, now I'm just gonna animate the neck. I'm, I'm not gonna do the same mistake. And now I'm just gonna... With these kind of uh, layers, I just go really quick and create the same... Let me see. Actually, here with the neck... Yeah, this is where it stopped moving. It stops moving.
Uh, so how the neck, the, the, oh my god, the, so as for how the head is going to move in relation to the neck, you know, I think when it anticipates it, it, the neck is sort of stretching here, and then here, it, you know, is going to slump, the head is slumping down into the shoulders. Again, you know, thinking about, you know, if there was a whole body here, if I were to just, just sort of pace the neck exactly where the rest is, it would look just how the head is looking right now, like it's, he's just like floating around, it's like a floating cat. And actually, you know, I want to imply that this is like, I don't know, a little little cat person, oh, you know, with like like a human with a, with a cat head. And, you know, they act like humans do instead of being a floating cat. So because he does go forward a little bit, uh, I am going to take the head forward, but keep the same relation to the shoulders. Yeah, like that. Kind of keep the shoulders more or less on the same place. Okay, lines up more or less with the nose. Now the shoulders can go a little bit to the back. Like, I mean, <laughs> the shoulders can kind of go down a little. I feel like, you know, still can follow a little bit of the motion. Don't need that much. There we go. Shoulder is going to be like here, here. Yeah. But this one. I kind of want the shoulders to slump a little more. Yeah, awesome. So, and you can, you know, you can play around a lot with these secondary motions. They can, they can be very subtle. For example, if I really wanted, you know, the cat to have those sad eyes, I can add some little sparkles on its eyes like he's, like he's steering up. Or wouldn't work that much with this character, but if it was a person, you can make their, their lower lips sort of tremble, you know, like there's the, just make the, the lip go up and down. Um, there's so many little things to add to the acting of the character. Um, and yeah, that was a little, little demonstration of secondary action. I really like this little guy. <laughs> really cute. Um, and yeah, if I'm correct, this was the, the last of the main, um, ooh, my voice kind of shook there. So this was the last of the main uh, principles. I'm going to go through some of the more theoretical ones on the next class just to kind of get them over with because it's better to just demonstrate them all at once, I think. And yeah, thanks for watching and I'll see you next time. All right, so I have already covered basically all the main principles so far and now there are just a few left that I kind of just want to um, talk about quickly now in the end and these are 
the principles that I want to talk about. I think these principles are some of the most general principles of animation and I feel like I can explain them pretty quickly. Um, I think that the one that I've been mentioning the most so far is exaggeration. And it really means um, exaggeration in a very vague and uh, general way, honestly. I feel like a lot of the things that I've been talking about, they in animation, they are benefited from exaggeration, even if, if it's just slightly exaggerated, but you know, anticipation, um, overlapping action, all those things, you know, um, they can really, they, they need to be very clear, and sometimes that means that they need to be exaggerated, and it just creates a more appealing performance, and especially with cartoons like uh, very with very comedic sort of cartoons exaggeration is your best friend um, usually just go as far as you can go and it will it will be fun you know so I think it's something present you know exaggeration is present in basically all the principles and it's something that you should keep in mind because uh, creating very subtle things in animation is pretty hard so it's usually better to go the other way and exaggerate so the other more general uh, principle is appeal appeal is mostly about uh, quality character design and not just character design really just uh, prop design and backgrounds, layouts, and all that. It, it comes, it, it only really works with experience, but you know, if you're looking at animation classics, especially the old Disney movies, you'll see that even the most despicable villains are very entertaining and appealing. Again, they have very solid designs, and appeal has a lot to do with good draftsmanship. And it is, again, I think I can talk more about appeal if I go to solid drawing. So solid drawing, I feel it's it came from when... Sorry, let me think that through a bit, a little better. So solid drawing, you know, it's, it's probably the most important when we're talking about hand-drawn animation, but again, Solid drawing isn't just about the act of drawing in general, it's also about the composition and again, knowing what is most appealing. But I think it, it still is very important even in types of animation that you don't really have to actually draw much, like, you know, the paper doll animation or 3D animation, but having an idea about, you know, what visually works best is still very important knowledge and a lot of people you know especially again I am talking mostly about hand-drawn animation now but the general advice is that don't even start animating if you still haven't figured out how to draw you know because it's way too many things to think about and you will get more quality animation by having more solid drawing because animation, to create believable characters, it's a lot about creating depth. And let's see. So the book that I've been using for most, uh, the most reference in these principal lessons is The Illusion of Life by Frank Thomas and Ollie Johnston. And they give this really good tip about avoiding twins, as they call it. It's a very common mistake when people are starting to draw and especially animate is that they won't only draw but animate characters moving sort of in this mirrored uh, fashion, you know, the, the hands do the same thing and, you know, even their, their placement, you know, they are straight ahead looking at the camera and, you know, these sort of angles, if you look especially at film, not animation, but, you know, live action. First off, camera angles are very carefully chosen and rarely will someone be looking straight um, towards the camera. And again, good actors don't usually act 
in this symmetrical way. You know, there's um, usually this asymmetry is a lot better. And it's not only about how things are, you know, making each side look different, but obviously this is a, this is a very simple drawing, but I I wanted to to uh, sorry. I I got lost in thought there. So and it's not only about the pose, but what's also important in, in avoiding these very flat angles in your drawings is that it also creates more depth to your character so having these little overlapping lines like over here on the leg maybe on the arm you know having your face in perspective this is a very you know simple drawing but if your character has eyes usually you know the eyes will be in perspective as well and you know Making your character look like it has mass, like it has volume, is also very, very important. And actually, in this example, I might have not uh, made, yeah, I did not make a very good example of something, is that, you know, you should avoid parallel lines. And here, I, I do that a lot. And so in my case, this isn't even the most solid and appealing drawing ever, but animation, it favors uh, organic shapes and more fluid shapes more than uh, very rigid ones especially again with hand-drawn animation and you know the book talks about a lot about these organic shapes that aren't symmetrical you know usually you know they will be like they just do these really abstract drawings about you know the kind of lines that you should look for when you're drawing. Let me see. Yeah, just in general things, uh, already the shapes themselves, they will... Um, they will... Oh my goodness, what's the word? <laughs> Okay, so the shapes themselves su should suggest movement, you know, not just on the animation itself, because animation means movement, but even on the shape. And again, this might have not been, uh, again, this might not have been the best example. I was mostly just talking about twins. But for example, when people are constructing characters for paper, paper doll animation, Oh, my my speaking is terrible today, sorry. Um, so when people are creating characters for paper doll animation, you know, they usually work with shapes. And I'm actually going to co construct a character in one of the next lessons, but it's so common that, let's see, I'm just going to pick like gray, you know, they draw the head. Sorry, let me prepare things properly. So in very, you know, beginner sort of animation, especially when people are drawing with uh, sort of paper doll styles, we see extremely rigid and just very geometric things. And I'm not saying that the drawing can't be geometric because, you know, people who pull off the geometric style, um, it can look really good. But I'm talking mostly about just, this sort of drawing where, you know, things are extremely straight, you know, and even and way too symmetrical as well. That's why in animation, as, um, as I was speaking, you know, we rarely draw characters looking straight at us because this straight design is not very appealing, you know. We usually want, you know, the three quarters because it just creates a lot more appeal, you know, you can... You have this fluidity of, you know, the profile and all that stuff. And a lot of characters are designed to only be looking sideways and never um, and never forward. We see, you know, if you've watched Phineas and Ferb, how Phineas is basically a triangle. I don't remember how his hair is, but, you know, he, he's... And in some episodes, they make the mistake of making him um, look forward. 
and it looks awful you know they make him sort of like this and then his nose is looking up and I don't know who had that idea because the purpose of the character was never to look directly forward and again with paper doll animation the exact thing happens where people because they're working with very uh, very flat shapes because this sort of geometric style is it, it really is more practical to work with but kind of how I was I, I'm gonna draw with the pencil I really can't keep working like this you know they make the the arms that are gonna be extremely rigid and well even anime sort of corrected that for me anime itself doesn't really like straight shapes with the brush and it loses so much of that appeal that I was talking about because I feel like solid drawing it creates appeal and it's you know uh, again those are I feel like those two principles are almost the same I just feel like appeal is a more is a broader term it comes down to like design principles and all that whereas solid drawing is a more technical approach and it's just a more specific part of appeal so again I was talking about paper doll characters and I, I feel like I'm gonna go more in depth in that and in, in the video I actually create but you know you can still apply a uh, hand-drawn you know like hand drawing and handmade things to paper doll characters and that geometric style it, it really is a trap if you don't really know what you're working with <laughs> so uh last but definitely not least is staging and this one is definitely the most general principle but i think the most important i think it takes everything in account and again it's a very uh general term but let's start from what the what the word might already make you think um so about the stage of it makes you think about the stage like in a like in a play or the scene itself so taking for example the short film i, di I directed um staging is a lot about being as clear as possible in in your work so if a scene is supposed to be spooky make it really spooky so you know, I put all the elements that make someone realize this is a spooky scene, you know, the, the dark forest, the creepy eyes looking back, you know, the character being, you know, scared because being scared of the dark. Uh, it really, this is, this has a lot to do with staging, you know, just, you know, making sure that her expression is readable and everything, you know, points towards this feeling that you want the viewer to, to feel when they're watching. And the same goes to, you know, I also wanted on the same short film to show the forest in a completely different light, quite literally, and uh, make it look like a safe and, you know, good place to be in. And, you know, with the color palette, even the angle, the, the elements on screen, they, you know, they all convey what I want. With I want with this environment. Let's see. And you know, staging can also be related to acting, and that comes from your character's body language. Again, when I was talking about uh, secondary action, I said it had a lot to do with staging because it makes uh, the action that your character is performing clearer because you're adding more and more things that are pointing towards that, you, let's say, the emotion that they're feeling, right? And staging also has to do, again, with visual, being visually clear as in, let's see, uh, the angle that you're shooting, let's say, um, shooting. We, we're, we don't really have a camera here, but anyway. You know, you want you want the angle and the composition of your scene again to favor whatever you're trying to say there. So if a character is pointing at something, not only let's say again the problem with the straight 
angle you know it's not very good because the silhouette for example isn't very readable because again here the silhouette is clearer because we can clearly see where that that arm is pointing at you know and the whole thing with silhouette also has to do with solid drawing you want your characters to have a, a clear a clear shape and here if we were to just fill this in you wouldn't see his arm much at all not completely you know actually the the arm that is resting here is clearer than the one that is actually performing the action so it's only it's actually drawing the intention away so again staging it really comes down to every single principle you know how you're animating things how you're drawing things how you're placing things in a scene and yeah it just sort of i feel like the the principles as you study them they become broader and broader and at the same time it also feels like they're becoming more and more specific so there are principles that talk about everything and there are principles that are extremely specific about what they're talking about like overlapping action versus just the word appeal <laughs> in general you know they are very um they really uh, made a really good job with how they organize the principles because I, I feel like it's a very effective way of remembering each of them. So yeah, that was the end of the principles. Next up, I'm just going to make some more specific applications of Adobe Animate. You know, you've seen me working on it. And I want to talk about some more technical stuff for last. So. Next up, I'm going to talk about more, you know, software specific things and anime before we wrap everything up. But I really wanted to talk about the principles and, you know, also uh, give some examples and show you how I work in this software. Because when you know the principles, you can animate in any way be it on paper or basically any software, you know, there are people who animate on softwares that don't even have animation um, interfaces, you know, people really find a way to create an animation somehow, you know, even if it's just by creating individual drawings and then compiling them, them in some sort of uh, video editing software, you know, the soft, the the animation software, it's, it's here to facilitate things, obviously. And if you have access to one such as Adobe Animate, that's great. But knowing the principles, knowing the theory and, you know, practicing animation, no matter how you're doing it, it's the most important part. And the rest is, you know, just technical stuff. However, there are things that, yes, it's important to know specifically how to work inside the software and I'm going to uh, talk about that in the next classes, such as, you know, how to build up a scene in this software, how to create a rigged character and how to, you know, create that hierarchy of body parts. Um, but I'm not going to go <laughs> into detail right now. But yeah, I hope this was informative. Bye bye. Hey there. Congratulations on completing this free four and a half hour Adobe Animate Essentials course. It's a pretty awesome achievement and I hope that you have enjoyed it. You are now ready to get started on creating some cool stuff. If you would like to uncover all the hidden tips and tricks of working with Adobe Animate, click the link below in the description box. The beginner to advanced course consists of many more hours of exercises and demos which will turn you into a pro in no time. You will be able to learn more about animating and work together with the instructor on many awesome projects. If that sounds like something you want, Go check it out. Thanks for watching and see you soon.